As of now, anyway. Everyone live now on. Fuck. I hate having to type it. HTTPS <laughs> double dot slash slash. Oh, bro. I just use um. www dot twitch. I just control all. That. I just control TV all that. slash. Couldn't just have like Willy. No, it has to be no. Willy beating himself. Pe- people need to know what's going on. Um, so if you are listening, we are going live at seven, but we're just going live or going properly live for the podcast slash chat at seven. But we'll just be um, talking a bit of smack, sort of getting used to everything. Before then, we got what, fifteen minutes, ten? Yep. So I'm currently at Willie's house, and we're just having a bit of fun, talking shit. Yeah, as always. How's the audio in that Milner? Is everything all sweet? Picture quality. Yeah. The beers beers are cold. Toxic as it's always toxic. <laughs> I don't know. Were you in on that at your wedding? The um, the toxic jokes. No. It was just everything was toxic. <laughs> everything was. It was like, it was like see that that's a, yeah. You, you were caught up in like um, real like formal shit, and we're just like yeah, nah, that's toxic. <laughs> like this is um, this is toxic people. <laughs> but um, it was brilliant. It was funny as hell. We both look hot apparently going to Milner. Yeah, but Milner's my pretty boy, so yeah, he has to say nice things. Yeah, as always. Pro Naples, what's going on, man? Yeah, what a legend. I'm not used to having it like this. What do you mean, up up on your phone? Yeah. Is there a slight lag between mine and yours on that? Oh. Oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Mill reckons get a mic like that. Yeah, I reckon he should. <laughs> how, how much better is it, Mill? Sound, he reckons it sounds better than I'm yours. I'm pure here just for the, uh, the comic relief, really. <laughs> Willie's the one still serving in the military as well, so... Yeah, this is this is me getting in trouble. He's got like a full legit setup. Like it's all cables everywhere, mixers <laughs> and stuff. My, I've got a digital mixer. It's all chilled and relaxed. Don't have to stress about uh, anything. Mil- Milner helped me get my mixer set up. I, was fu- I had no idea what's going on. Really? <laughs> I was like, I was like, Wait, hey man, job though. Yeah, and then, I, then he's like, press, um, press like a uh, line or USB button. I press it, and everything worked perfectly. <laughs> God damn. Nah, he said he didn't sort it out. Nah, so, you know, I needed you. I didn't understand what phantom power was before then. But, you know, Quasi. for the kids, apparently major respect because I'm, I'm your child. Another one <laughs> doing it for the kids. <laughs> Is this one of your things? Yeah, it's a, for the Damn charity it. event. So sorry if I keep looking down because I actually have to look at chat on my phone because... Willie really doesn't own a tablet. <laughs> he, he owns... He owns legit one surface pro laptop Oi, don't diss it and and that is it <laughs> so he he gets he gets chat on the big screen and i get it on my phone so <laughs> i've got i've got 1500 bucks worth of microphones and audio mixes and a laptop pretty much he's not lying <laughs> and headphone amps everything and a laptop that's right even got even got my soundproofing up now pro is that apparently hayley's got food before the stream we um we got burgers also. Yeah, we got beers and burgers. We got beers and burgers. Tech support MacGyver. Do you know tech tech support MacGyver? Nope. Okay. What oh, is it? You sounded like you said it. You sounded no, like you guys, you guys tech support MacGyver. Oh. You don't have a laptop? No. Mate, I've got like two of the best computers you could possibly buy. Yeah. That's I what don't you need, need a laptop. I don't leave the house. You know, like this is the second time I've left the house in a week, and I'm feeling like uh, it's it's getting into a bad habit. I need to start going. Uh, Getting getting locked back into my room again. Yeah. See, see, I I do go out of the house, so that's why I've got a laptop. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, what we're what we're gonna do is we're just talking shit for ten minutes, let some people get in here, and then um, oh shit, I gotta host this. That's what I haven't done. Oh, what are you doing to me? Oh, sorry, Willie. God damn. Oh, we got plenty of beers, and I think we've got some more in the fridge in case we run out. But wifey can pick me up and drive me home and drop off beers if needed. I think. True, true. What sort of um what sort of kebabs do you get, Haley? I'm gonna I'm gonna judge you straight off that. What type of kebab do I get? Mm. Nah, Haley Haley reckons she's got a kebab all set for the stream. Slash host. Uh, small thing, Pasilli. Willie's on the left and looks to his right to see you. Oh yeah. So I look that way to talk to you and it looks like I look the other way. Just give me one sec. I'll fix that. There still is on it. The man himself to fix, to fix all. See, Milner, this is why we need you. That should work, shouldn't it? 
You don't want me to switch around? No, no, no. It, it's just me. Uh, Milner, how much better is that? Is that better? Witchcraft confirmed. Uh, lamb kebab. No, no, you need, you need a mix. You need to mix the kebabs. You can't just do lamb. I think anyway. Oh. So I went to subscribe to the channel and it's telling me I have to pay 10 bucks to subscribe. I don't know why it's not just a normal tier one sub. Has anyone else had a problem subbing? Twitch subscription, one month. Oh no, I'll have to look at it when I get home. That's so weird. Can you still watch that? Yeah, I'm watching. Oh, sweet. Okay, that's fine. As long as, as long as we can watch that. That's what we want. Unless you want, unless you want to sub to me, um, that's also that's also fine. I'm from Pesto. We stream on, uh, in the morning. I was the guy who was talking about the youth session. No worries, dude. Yeah, so we're going to kick this off in about 10 minutes, and then after that we'll be... Uh, Full swing, talking about military and all that. We're just waiting, some, allowing some time for people to get in here. Yeah. I was talking about the you session. God, that was a while back for you. <laughs> like yesterday for me. A decade ago. <laughs> we were chatting about that this morning, the age difference between us. Yeah, Milner's like... Not Milner. Oh, Milner like, subbed me. Will, hey, man, thank you. Willie's like... You're, you're my first sub. <laughs> Willie goes, oh, I got, I got that camera when I finished G12 like four years ago. I'm like, you finished your 12 four years ago? I'm well, you're like, what, 10 years older than me? I'm, I'm 23. 23. Yeah. So, yeah. Are you 33 this year? Yeah. Yeah, you're 10 years older than me. That so, makes sense. I was like, yeah, 2014, you know, got my camera, joined the army. And then you're just like, I was, um, was joining the army then. Like, uh, oh, sorry, like you're well within your career. Like I finished 2004. It's crazy. Yeah, so... I'm I, a young pup. I finished high school in 2004. Yeah. And that, that was my year 12. And then Willie's like, oh yeah, I finished fucking high school five years ago. I'm like, <clears throat> I just look old. Lid. I'm not actually, I'm not actually old, but just look at, I'm weathered. I'm weathered. Sorry, I'm well, just trying to, I'm trying to just get the last of my phone set it up. Milner reckons I've done more in my life than you. Oh. <laughs> I don't think that's a bit of a, do you just find that as an insult? Because I don't think I've done that much. Um, I don't know. I've done a fair bit in my life, man. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't know. Willie lives his life to the full, so which is very important. Oh, do I? I do, but then I, I also like to drink. <laughs> that happens. I used to drink. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe when I'm 30, 33, I'll, uh, I'll drink. Oh, sorry, I'll stop drinking. Um, but we'll have to see. I said he's done more than you. Ah, oh, yeah, Milner, but you you want theatre and just sit there and change lights and turn them off and on and you know, I, um, get really excited. I occasionally that. slide in Milner's DMs with like lights that are off so if it's like a string of like a fairy lights and there's yeah. one off and there's I'll just send like a video pan around and just zoom in on it and I'll get a <laughs> message back like later on like you're a brick <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's probably my favourite thing to do uh, Katie you're not late at all we're not starting until um until 7 so we've got according to me 5 more minutes yeah, until we'll, we we'll wait 5 start. more minutes and then we'll crack, crack straight into it yeah without further ado let's crack straight into it so you've got all these taglines down I don't have any of them uh, you're not late. You're not late, Katie. Don't yeah. stress. Paul said to me, he's like, oh yeah, so when, when, when it hits seven, you just you just crack into like your intro for this. I'm like, what? My intro for this? Like, yeah. I, I've, I've got an intro? Like, okay. Professional podcaster right here. Invites me around to have a chat. <laughs> Stream it. Doesn't even have an intro. Well, this is my first ever like split podcast with like two people. Oh, wait. We actually, I think we need to turn you as well. Because you're looking, if you look at me, you're looking off I camera. said that. And he's God like, damn no, it. don't worry. Well, he said it looked fine. I'm blaming Milner, not myself. Look at that. Let's see how that looks. Oh, look at that. It's like slides in. I'm like... Whoosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can come at... I'm sliding oh, I, into I his... can't. Oh, yeah, here I am. Yeah. I can reach in. I can reach in. It's... um. We're on different sides of the country. I've just got really long arms. Oh. Um, we can always watch the VOD, Katie. Yeah, yeah. It's Katie's 18th in... Um, because Katie always comes on all these. She's turning 18 in like a, in like a week. How long is it, Katie? And she, she wants to have a special shout-out on her birthday for the um, for the live. Fair enough. Mm. You, you go, go party on. with her, I guess. She's um, no, She lives too far away. But she's like my most loyal viewer, I think. Tuesday. Well, happy birthday for Tuesday, Katie. Tuesday. Yeah, happy birthday. Seems good to me. Have you got any plans, Katie? She reckons um, she's going to have her first beer. That's what she said to me last time. You ate she's and never, you yeah, and you she's, live in Australia and you've never had a beer. She's never had a beer. Never had a single drop of alcohol before. Even my dad. Like my dad's not a big drinker, is it? 
Well, if he drinks, he drinks like whiskey or something. Yeah. But he'd still give me a beer before I was 18. Yeah, no, I can't, I can't believe Katie's never had anything. I'm, I'm, I'm talking shit. She's going to come in soon and be like, once he's catched up and be like, I told you I've had beer. <laughs> she, 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 she reckons she's already had her beef with me. That's fair. <laughs> That's right. Mm. All right, should we crack into it? Yeah, let's... Um, now I've got three minutes. Do you want to finish it or crack in? Crack in. All right. Um, so... If anyone will bear with me, this is my first one of these podcasts. I'm going to be having a variety of people that have been sort of significant to me within my journey, both pre-cancer and post-diagnosis on, um, who have not only been influential to me, but I think are influential in society. Um, I'm going to live stream all of these um, as an interactive podcast, so you guys can ask questions as we go. I may not be able to answer all of them, depending on the speed, but we're going to do our best. So I'm here, sitting here with Pestilli, or Paul as I know him, um, who was a corporal in the army in my section, um, who led me through the jungle a couple of times, probably yelled at me a few times. Um, I wasn't much of a yeller. I wasn't much of a yeller. Um, but we've had a fair bit of experience with each other. Yeah. Um, he's, of course, everyone probably here knows who he is and a professional at this. It's my first, sort of first go at this, so... Um, so leave it up to me. We'll see how we go. This will be on YouTube after if you want to cut back to anything. So without better to do, hey, Paul, how are you? I'm good, thanks, mate. Yeah. So thanks for having us here. Um, Willie invited me to come and have a chat with him on his, on his Twitch channel. He used to do these on YouTube, but it had a lot of technical issues. And then when he said he was going to come over to Twitch, I said I'd help him learn some of the ropes. And I thought thought we had a discussion, so it'd be a cool idea. Just A lot of people on my channel in particular um, always asked oh what's it like in the army what's some funny stories what's your favorite gun all that kind of stuff and and i'm not big on talking about military but if i have a conversation with someone it's a lot easier for me and i think and so willie and i had a discussion and said it'd be a good idea if we could just have a bit of a chat and and answer people's questions at the same time as talking about joining and the troubles that we went through and the ups and downs and the, like everything the military is one of those worlds it's it's its own world oh yeah it's, it's a very unique world too. It's unique. It can be a bit, a bit backwards occasionally. And the, and the public perception is totally off. Like they don't really know. You don't know until you're there. No, there's, no. There's no way, like if you're joining up and you're like, oh, my cousin's in the army and he told me everything. You don't know shit, bro. Like, On that, seriously. we don't know your cousins. If you say, my cousin's in a unit and he drives a truck. Do you know Jono? Yeah, do you know Jono? I know 14 Johnstons just in one unit. Right. He's at Townsville. <laughs> I'm not sure though. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I'm like one of a million willies. Um, so Dan asked, we served together. Yeah, we did. We did serve. Yep. Um, I'm not really sure what years. It would have been 2015. 2015. Yeah. yeah. So year I got uh, year I got back from Indonesia. I was living mm. in Indonesia in 2015 for for six months. Yeah. And uh, Willie was straight out of Singapore, I think, at that yeah, stage. Yeah, I was pretty. I was pretty fresh. You're pretty juvie. Um, I wasn't straight into yours. I served. I was in Lowry's section at the time with yeah. Larry and Gilly um, and then I'm not actually sure I moved across with you with Evo yeah yeah. I'm not really sure how that worked but we, went, <laughs> we oh, ended up there that was, last, <laughs> that was the last minute arrangement and we got sent straight up to uh, Townsville which is the northeast of Australia and um, it's right in the jungle tropical yeah. leeches all the good stuff there wasn't that many leeches actually but cassowaries they're like giant <laughs> emus they pretty much were the reserves for the emu war that we lost yeah, yeah and yeah. so um, and they were the ones that pushed through that got the emus over the line but yeah got a bit um the jungle got a bit ridiculous so w you joined in 2014 2014 Did late late 2014 and that was straight after year 12 or? straight after year 12 so i finished year 12 had graduation say on a let's just say wednesday and that friday i was in the army so i was like a 20 it's probably a 36 hour period later oh wow i was <laughs> still i was supposed to put it there, i was still hung over from grad getting off the bus at kapooka thing and this shouldn't be too hard it's three months who cares like so did you start your your um startup process whilst you were 17 then yeah yeah so i started 17 uh, pretty late 17 um and then i went through so um yeah so i started late 2017 and then into um when i was 18 i think is actually maybe when they did my um the one after you session the employment session yep. um and then yeah i finished off year 12 i told them i really wanted to finish year 12 they gave me enlistment dates prior to finishing but i sort of told them i really want to finish just for pro well, both career progression but as far as if i ever got out um yes yeah, so i finished and then straight in i think it was november 25th um 2014 um so yeah it should be um should be real good yeah so 
Um, my, my actual enlistment process was a little bit different. So I actually joined as a reservist back in 2000. I started, yeah, 2005. I actually signed up as a reservist, went to Kapuka, did all my basic training at Kapuka. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then was at a reserve unit for about six months. And I was like, nah, this is shit. Yeah. And so I actually left as a reservist for three years. And then yeah. I signed back up full time in 09. Mm-hmm. But the, my, the second time through, and I know there's a guy in chat, he, he um, was about to go through his youth session. And I think at the youth session, you get the medical papers and you fill out all the paperwork and that. Yeah. And then the following one, you do like the actual medical exams, you're pissing cups and shit. Yeah. And I um, I was a massive gym junkie. I actually posted a photo on uh, my Twitter. That was insane. I never knew you like that. Yeah, you so were I, huge. Yeah, so I used to be a massive gym junkie. And so I used to take supplements like crazy. Mm. Protein bars, like pre-workout, post-workout. I was like all over it. And I did the piss test and I came back with too high. They actually say don't take any supplements for 72 hours before your piss test. <laughs> and I still can't, I didn't do it. I didn't take the supplements, but I came back uh, high in protein in my urine. And so I had to Is do it. Deal? Well, it means your kidneys are failing. Oh, okay. Your yeah. kidneys aren't cleaning your, your piss out, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And, um, but the thing was, I just having too much protein. Yeah. And so I had to actually go wait a month, do three separate piss tests and piss in a in a bottle for 24 hours and then they send that off and then get that set back and because of that process my actual enlistment date got pushed back six months because they just had, I had to wait for the the, the reports to come yeah, back and yeah, all that shit. so when it comes down to that medical side of things that's brutal if, if you have even like my cousin tried to sign up with mm. uh, a dislocated elbow Di- dislocations are like a no-go they're like yeah. no nah. they're yeah. like no nah, yeah. there's too Straight high risk off. yeah yeah so there's so many things that if you have any weird injury they're just like nah not worth the risk because what happens when you join the military if anyone doesn't know well this is the australian army for example they're liable for all your medical bills so once they sign you in and you've signed that dotted line from that day onwards if you stub your toe yeah. or you Anything. have a massive injury brain cancer like myself yeah they're, they're liable yeah they're liable so they have to pay for your all your medical from that point onwards so anything pre-existing they're like nah not worth it yeah it's- it's, yeah, that, that's why they're so hard on it. I know they're very hard on um, the color blindness too. It pulls a lot of people up. A lot well, of people don't realize it restricts their roles. They yeah. can, drastically because at the end of the U session, you get a big sheet of paper with I think three tiers on it yeah. of like um, like what jobs you can do, like the infantry up to fighter pilot, pretty much. Yeah, um, yeah if you are color blind or whatever, have, then you can restrict on your roles. Yeah, I actually still have my, that piece of paper. I actually oh really? Yeah, so I actually have it as a bit of a memento because. I always kicked myself because I had, uh, I'm a bit cluey mm. and I had every job. And when I was sitting there with the actual sergeant and he's like, oh, yeah. what job do you want, son? <laughs> and I'm like, infantry, sir. <laughs> and he's like, really? <laughs> You're going to have all you these sure? jobs. You like, could you could fly a jet. <laughs> nah. No. Infantry, infantry. sir. Um, I was sort of the same. I think I got all of them as well. I think. I'm not going to quote myself on that. Someone will probably pull me up, but I'm pretty sure I got all of them. Um, and the, I originally was wanting to go direct entry commandos. Yeah. And just by luck, which never happens at like DFR, I had an infantry, either seco or sergeant, like corporal or sergeant there, be like, hey man, like how serious are you? I'm like, yeah, real serious. He's like, how old are you? I'm like, 17, 18. And he's like, look, don't go direct entry. <laughs> he's like, he's like, bro, it might seem on. easy in movies and shit, but that's... Um, it's incredibly hard, man. He's like, get in, do your time, see how you like it, and then if you want to then go into those special forces positions, um, go from there, man. Yeah, so I am just on the colorblind side of things. So I know, um, I think tank drivers can't drive, if, so tankies can't be colorblind. No. Nah. There's certain jobs in the military that you can't do, but there's other ones that they're like, yeah, yeah sweet. A lot, of, a lot of shit where you're looking down, like optics and stuff, you can't. Yep. So like, um, and especially with like your head-up displays, yep. like because it's all green. Yeah. Um, same, I know, I know the big one for pilots is like you need good vision because it's, of course, a green head-up with, you know, red symbols and everything if you can't determine between them. Do you um, know if infantry you can be or not? Yeah, you can be colorblind. You can be colorblind. Infantry. Yeah. Um, stuff like uh, engineers, they struggle. Um, Ramy. <laughs> yeah. Or engineers cut the red, cut the red cord for the bomb. Oh, it's all the same uh, color. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. There's, 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 yeah, there's that's, some jobs. Yeah. That's, that's normal. Like a, a, um, a plant operator. So someone who's driving forklifts and stuff. They're sweet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what what do you remember of Kapuka? Because yours is oh. a lot fresher than me. God, it's not it's not that fresh. Um, like it, it is fresh, but my memory is terrible. I remember being like a deer in the headlights when I first got there. Like I never did cadets, cadets anything, so I never did anything like military. All I did was watch like telly. Yeah. Um, 
I remember getting off that bus, getting like absolutely blistered, getting off it, like just screamed at, and like go to your rooms, like you know, drop all your shit, get out the front, like form up, and they do all this stuff that you don't know how to do yet, so you'll purposely stuff it up so they can have a reason to yell at you more, yeah. and then marching and trying to march like like you'll see the Russians do on like um the Red Square Parade, or whatever they do with like the legs up and everything, and people marching like that on there, like that on square gating marching, which is like your arm goes up on your same so your foot. right arm would go up with your right, right foot. foot yeah like terrible um and just the blandness of at least i was in the old you would have been as well in like the older accommodation i know they've started to upgrade it now i've got no idea what it's like now. <laughs> but when I, when I was there it looked like um if anyone's gone to a school where they've got like an old old cubicle from like the 70s it's like that like it's like vinyl like the blue vinyl floor yeah and then like a lighter that shade of really blue on the really walls. yucky gray and vinyls like the weird and... well almost like the green i've got on the walls here um and it's just like nothing like that you're sleeping you know four people to a room and it's just i went from high school stuffing around not doing that much into this like regimented grown-ups like dominated space and i'm like oh my god like what have i i remember the first night i'm like what have i got myself into and What's it called when you di- when you leave at Kapuka? Is it uh March out? No, nah, there's a form you can put in to leave in like the first three weeks. I forgot what it is, but it's like a um They had they didn't have that form when I was there. Yeah, but it's like a withdraw at your own request thing. Really? Yeah, you can you can march up, do like the door knock procedure. So so if anyone who doesn't know here hasn't gone to Kapuka, um so just to just yeah. to clarify also Kapuga is basic training. Oh, basic, yeah. It's 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 ARTC, so the Australian Recruit Training Center. It's so the Army Recruit mm. Training Center. Uh, and and that's that's boot camp for yeah. anyone non Australian oh, in chat. Um, yeah. So to talk to any of the section commanders or the sergeant, or whatever, you have to like march up, come to attention, bang on the door like as loud as you can, and then they'll yell back like, "What do you want?" And then you got to like, "Oh, Private Williams here to see Corporal whoever, um, like Corporal," <laughs> and they'll come in and say, and you can hand in a form that makes can get you like, to leave. Anyway. I remember for the first like three weeks, I wanted to do that, but I was too scared to go and do the door knock. <laughs> so I was like, this, like, this is too scary, too shit to be here, yet I'm too scared to march out, so I better just stay. <laughs> I better I better just stay and finish it. That's It's less intimidating to do 80 days Hide or three months. Mates. Yeah, literally. Um, but it was it was pretty intimidating. Like That's what I got first off, is people in uniform. You know, I was a child at the time. Like, I was 18. And I'm a tiny dude. You're still a child. I am still a child. But then, like, these, like, grown men just screaming at me. And I'm like, like, here. And I'm like, what's going on here? Is, did you have a similar experience? Um, Because I did the... So, when I did it as a reservist, yeah. I did the old school Kapuka. So, they actually used... Kapuka used to be two modules. It used to be a 42-day module and or a 45-day module and then, like, another 45 days after it. So yeah. everyone did the exact same. Full time reserves did the exact same first forty five days. Yeah, and then there was a second forty five days, and so I did the old school forty five day module. And then when I went full time, I did the ninety days like you did. Yeah, <laughs> but I because I'd already done Kapuka before, and I didn't tell anyone. Oh yeah. So the second, like the first time through, I was like really, I was petrified, hating life. It was fucked. Like it was shit. Yeah, like, I, I was <laughs> yeah. just like. I want to go home. I like this is like weeks, week one, day three. I'm just like, nah, nah. I want to go home. Mm. I don't like this shit. It's, I'm waking up early. I'm cleaning floors, making beds, making I, like it was just shit. <laughs> and you know, like I had a girlfriend at the time, and I, like I missed her, and I was just like, this is shit. Mm. And then, so the whole first experience, I was just like, really, I was 19 years old, just I had spent plenty of time away from home. So the missing home part, it wasn't missing home. It was. I didn't like the experience, mm. but I had a really interesting corporal back then. Um, he <laughs> Inter- interesting. He was very old school. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and he was very harsh. And, yeah. And and back back when I signed up in 05, it was fucking rough. It was rough right? starts, yeah. So he pulled me like I I said I want to go. Home. I, I I went in there. I got, I actually got a letter written up so I could go home. Really? Yeah, um, I got it sent in from uh, my parents, and I, I've never really told anyone this actually. Oh, God. But I got this par- my parents to write in saying I'm needed back at work because I was I worked with my parents mm. at that stage uh, in the in warehousing, and I, I took the letter in. I go, yeah, um, my stepdad needs me to to work. Yeah, and he goes, I'm gonna be really straight with you here. Is this like I don't care if this is bullshit or not, but if you are just quitting for the sake of going home, you're gonna quit at everything in your life. No matter yeah. how easy, how hard it is, you're going to look for that easy excuse. Even if you're hating this, like no, like 
absolutely hating it. There's three weeks left. If you just push through, get the last three weeks done, you know, you'll, you'll at least know that you can push through a shit situation and be able to do it. And like he would have he said, I will set this and I'll get, organize it for you to go home mm-hmm. if you have to. But like you should really consider it and, and finish these three weeks. And believe it or not, at 19 years old, he's probably the most motivational person I've ever had in my <laughs> yeah, life. Yeah. Because that talking there led to me doing so many things in my life where it was like, this is shit. This is hard. I, I don't know if I can finish it. And then now I finish it. Like, yeah. 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 For the guys in my chat, like with my streams and that, like a 1 to 40 stream with, with when I play my games, like I have to make sure I finish it now because mm. I, I'm very determined and goal driven to finish something. Mm. I think I think it's, it's sort of worthwhile to point out the reason Kapuku is hard is they're taking kids like you and me who are 18 or 17 to sort of 19 average age and turning you into a soldier and that's not an easy thing to do if you've got 90 days to change me as a guy who hung around high school wag in school every second day I used to go skateboarding and fuck yeah, school off yeah um, easy thing to do is just skip, skip class go skateboarding yeah, with my into a professional soldier whose medical's paid for we're paying a really good salary everything you know they, they really need to, to smash you a bit and there's no better way to sort of I guess put someone in that position than really you know sort of carve them out it's not an easy thing though not an easy thing to go through but the worst thing for me is as Kapuka was ending I'm like it's all done like all that shit I finally get to move on with my career it's done um, and then you get the bus from Wagga in Kapuka to Singleton the school of infantry and it all restarts again <laughs> yeah like, it all starts again when you get the Singo so Singo school that's of when it inf- really starts infantry, it's just like you thought you had it tough at Kapuka Kapuka's just like day Pre-school. one week one yeah it's <laughs> yeah. like, like yeah. kindergarten yeah like yeah they they you had to get up early and go to bed late but it was just easy days of just sitting there polishing brass and listening to lessons and not trying to fall asleep mm. um in singo it's like get up every morning hard pt forward by smashed lessons penalties every time you didn't get something wrong uh, mm. right so i might have changed by, by the time willie got in there but when i was in Capu- in singo if you stuffed up anything, it was like, no, nah, that's it. Burpees, yeah. push-ups. It, they didn't care. Like Now the punishment has to fit the crime in the military. Mm. And we'll talk about current day military soon. But um, yeah, like back then it was just like, no, nah, we're going for a run. You guys are shit. <laughs> and you're like, what? Pack up your shit. We're going for a run. And you're like, oh my God, not again. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah I remember doing, um, because when I was there, they couldn't do PT without PTI present. Um, which I guess is a new a new style. They never had that. Um, I think. When I was there. But a loophole in that was yeah, but they could make us do um, like infantry related stuff. So if we before knocking off, we could they couldn't make us do burpees, but they could make us do fire positions. Yeah. So okay, you'll need to be the standing firing position, prone lying like lying firing position. Yeah. So it's the exact same as the burpees, but just going between firing positions. Yeah. And that's a loophole in it to get out of it. Um, I remember Singo being pretty rough though, like sort of a when you and me went through it was men only well we had we had three people go AWOL and Singo did you? we had no one go AWOL and Kapuka and three go because we got weekend leave mm. and um, and on the weekends three times people didn't come back yeah if um, if anyone's in this chat who went through Singo with me I can't remember we we only finished say there was like say 45 started ours we only finished with like 26 of the original guys so we had a lot of back squads yeah. uh, like back squad for those who don't know is when like you fail a module or a test and you get put in a platoon behind you to sort of retest that. Um, but we finished with probably half to two-thirds of the guys. Um, do you, were there mostly injuries? Uh, yeah, there were a few fa- like shortfalls at points of like mainly LF9 on the machine gun, which is yeah. like a machine gun shoot. Where you run with the yeah. LSW and... That's in like the first two weeks though. Yeah. The first two or three weeks. So you haven't really shot the um, F89 that much. Um, and then we had some, yeah, it's mainly injuries actually. Yeah, if, now thinking back on it, it's, it's mainly injuries. So a yeah. couple of people pull off some other stuff of just like if people had to miss out on a week due to a funeral or something, of course they've missed a week of training, they need to go back and recomplete that week. But yeah, it's pretty injury prone, I guess. If you're running yeah. everywhere, it, it's... You're, and it's under weight all the time. Yeah, if, if, if anyone in chat or is, is listening is ever interested in joining the infantry, you you don't know your body's capabilities until you've you've gone to school of infantry. I don't I I'd, I'd imagine it's the same across every single military, mm. no matter where you are. Oh, it's heavy. I think the Australian Army is the heaviest army in the world, though. 
I don't know. Oh, I, I could I, be wrong. I don't know any, any much about other militaries besides yeah. Southeast Asia, but fuck. I'm not sure, because we, we sort of specialise in long-range patrol, I guess. Yeah. Like, because the freaking country so big. Um, but yeah, it's heavy. Like, that's probably one of the big things I remember from Singo, though. The, the Singo, I'm not sure if you'd agree with this, but was probably the best time in my career. School of it Infantry. It was the best boys' boys' time. But, yeah, because, like, you do something new every week. Like, one week is grenades, and you do, like, assault grenade range, everything. Then the next week is, like, high explosive, like, recoilless rifle, like a rocket launcher yep. in that week, and then urban. But on those weekends, because it's just such a, a club of dudes at the time... <laughs> It's like we they had these digger shuttle. I don't know if they did have the digger shuttle when you were there. No, I don't think they did. They had this company of buses that would pick us up from the front gate of Singo and drive us for ten bucks, even around ten or twenty bucks into Newcastle. Wow! So like, and they'd stop right like just out of Singleton, so um, Singleton where the base is to Newcastle, say an hour and a, hour and a half ish, just out of Singo. They'd stop at like a bottle o, like a bottle shop. We'd pick up like those big, you know, those bucket o shots, or whatever they are. Like the big shot buckets, we pick up some of them <laughs> and a heap of beers, and then the next hour just sort of get on it um, and arrive in Newcastle. Like all the boys off the bus go rent there right across from the Maccas where they drop us off, like right in the heart of Newcastle. Yeah, there was an Ibis like budget hotel. Yeah, I stayed there. <laughs> I remember putting. <laughs> I remember it was a two single bed, like two single beds in a place, and we had fourteen dudes in it. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, I remember just like going up, I'm like yeah, I'm, I'm like wanting a one room. I'm like oh yes, yeah, so we just you and your friend. Like, yeah, yeah, that's us. Blah blah blah. And then like as soon as we got the keys, like, come on boys, <laughs> and like just a rushing of dudes. And because if you've got fourteen guys, we're all going out that night. Like pretty hard going out, and of course you got two room keys. <laughs> so guys are locked out. Like if you had a room key, you were like a god. At like three in the morning, people <laughs> like three in the morning at lockout, people like where's Willie? Like has Willie has Willie got it? Like um, yeah, it'd be hilarious. I I miss that a lot. Um, now that I've just ticked over because it's a four year minimum yeah. for infantry. Well, yeah. at least when I was there, they may still run the gap year, but all the guys I came in with have started sort of coming out, getting out of the army. And I guess it's sort of like I've spent a lot of time recently, like reminiscing, almost like oh, I remember yeah, when we so all went to those pubs and like the, if anyone's from Newcastle, here, Honeysuckle Hotel <laughs> and King Street, um, oh, King Street Hotel or, or Kingers, whatever it is, was just like our stomping ground at the time. But yeah. I think every AJ, like every army guy, thinks that he's like we were the loosest, and of course, like everyone thinks they're the loosest, like we were the hardest. But yeah, and I think that's probably what gets you through all the shit times in the military. Oh, like, we're not even talking about school of infantry right now like those times where you're with your mates mm. really taking it taking the brunt of the bullshit oh yeah um being with your mates doing the funny shit like oh we'll get to funny stories yeah. eventually but <laughs> just those those weekends those moments with your mates that is what gets you through those days where you just like i can't believe i just have to do this shit yeah oh but i um for those of you who don't listen it's a bit of a disclaimer here i'm still active service in the military um so i will be a bit be careful with what Whereas i don't do. give a fuck i'm Where just gonna be loose pestle is out and he can do whatever he wants i'm not i can't do whatever i want but you can do more than me yeah you can do as long as, as long as it goes with twitch's um <laughs> sort of community guidelines <laughs> you're good um i've got to stay in toz <laughs> so we'll do what we can um yeah, but yeah. yeah well, I, I miss Singer. Do you remember your first day in the battalion? <laughs> yeah, um, I remember rocking up, and this dude, we came in as all you guys were at field, like the whole unit was at field, so there was no one, um, and every, we got put in because you have to live on at least when I was there, you had to live on base for the first twelve months. Yeah, and that's what it was when I was. That's why you called a lid. That's why you called a lid, living in Dick. Yeah, because um, so anyone who's just been in the military for the, or for the in, in the infantry battalion. For the first 12 months, you have to live on base. And so if someone was a new guy, they were a lid. And you'd yeah. hear like, the new guys as they're walking in the base. Like, lid, lid. You'd, just, you'd, be, you'd be walking in like your PT gear to your room. Like, it's like, oh my God, I don't know this base. And then Carl just drive past with like five senior diggers. just like, lid. You'd be like, oh no. <laughs> like, that's, that's, I wonder yeah. who that's to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember who rocking up. Lid? And everyone else had a room but me. And I was like, that dude. I'm like, oh no. And they put me in like this transit, like the worst oh, accommodation. Yeah, transit on that base. Literally like a dog box. Like, and we called them dog boxes like sucked and i remember being on the phone to mum and dad like i can't do this like i've gone from sort of just putting up with kabuka putting up the singo and then i've got to the battalion where it's meant to be good where i'm meant to spend my next three and a half years and i'm in this shitty thing getting lid yelled at me yeah. like oh no and then like we had to do like a basic fitness assessment and everything and they sort of grade you on that of what company you go to uh, to a degree yeah um anyway 
I did like all of that and then got put in a, a unit and that whole company was outfield. And I and they're like, you're not going outfield, don't worry. Like the boys are out there next like two weeks, you guys are just gonna chill. You're in a brand new city, you're gonna learn like sort of the ropes, do what you can, get used to it, you know, whatever. By that afternoon, Willie, you're going field. <laughs> like you guys are all going field. Like who do you think you are? And we're like, we've got no gear. Like our our trunks are still coming down from Singo. We thought that was our way out. Well, I've got nothing. Yeah. Like I've got and that's zero typical gear. Lid thinking. Like what? lids are like, oh, we could just not not go field because we don't have our gear. We and, have no and, gear. And the the, the bosses, you'd be like, let's look. We'll go to the rehabs and we'll get the rehabs to give them their yeah. gear. Yeah, I'm piecing together kit. I've got like old tier, <laughs> oh whatever the legacy tier T bass was. Like the, was, the body armor. It was. Oh. It was just legacy. It wasn't it? Land Squadron. It was uh oh, I won't it was remember. one five three or something. It was like the original multi cam, not the yeah. AMCU body armor with like the two front plates, everything. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> like here we go. Borrowing um one of the boys. Oh, I, can't, I won't say his name on camera, but one of his helmets. Like everything's just pieced together. No idea what's going on. Um, I get out in the field, and we arrive there, and literally we get off. Like I had no idea what's going on. Get off the bus. Like oh no, like I'm here. And um, one of our good friends, uh, I would say Mike, comes up yeah. and he's like, and they're like, righto, who does what here? What experience have you had prior to this? And I'm like, ah, oh, like, what have, what have you ever done? I'm like, oh, I used to be like a, um, uh, like a volunteer firefighter. He's like, I'll have him. <laughs> and right at that point, uh, Mike goes to me, he's like, Willie, I'll have Willie. And um, that was the first ever time I've been called Willie. So he started it and it's just gone forever. Really? Um, then called Willie. And next thing I met um, Gilly straight yeah. off. And I thought he was like the scariest sort of ever met. Like he's like fiery <laughs> ginger just yelling at everyone. I'm like, who the fuck is this? He's a private, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a private. He's probably still a fucking private. <laughs> don't, don't, don't bring it up. You might jinx him. Um, <laughs> and I was like, this is the scariest thing ever. And they're like, right, oh, here's your night vision, blah, blah, blah. And at this point, we didn't have the Wilcoxes. <laughs> so we've got. You're like holding your, your Literally, MVG. so if you see on the helmet behind Pestilli, like where the night vision goes on to the helmet, there's like a mount. That's a Wilcox, or we call it a Wilcox mount. Yeah. Um, I didn't have one of them, so I couldn't even have my monocle, like my night vision on. So it just sort of um, sort of went to shit for me. <laughs> but yeah, that was like sort of my first experience. And like that afternoon, we stepped into, that was um, the infamous Balls Walk, whatever it was. We yeah. Covered oh, like the, that one. 130 Ks in like three or four days. Yeah. But the funny thing is, the guys were still in who did that, like myself. Every time a new guy comes in, I reckon we plus 10 Ks to it. Because I reckon it was, I reckon it was like ninety to one hundred k's, like hand on heart, nine to one hundred k's in three the days. The warriors get more and more. Hardcore. The warriors get the, more and more hardcore. Like we since. just had a heap of guys march in. They're like, oh yeah, and I was like, yeah, the the, the death march, hundred and sixty k's. Like you just keep pushing it. By the time I'm sixty, I'm like four hundred k's. Like it's ridiculous. And they were whipping us. <laughs> but I guess I got put in. And I'm still good mate. So the section commander at the time who gave me um, the name Willie. Yeah. I, I was talking to him on the phone earlier today. And we're probably going to catch up after this. Like, really good. I was scared shit of him at the time because every other corporal before then, uh, Kapuka Singo, is like, oh, yes, corporal, no corporal. They're the ones dealing out the hate um, and the sort of the punishments and the training um, where now they're your yeah, mates, I guess. And then you were that sort of to me. Do you remember your first day in battalion? Was it similar to that? Or? Ooh, my first day was, um, so I flew to Darwin and I only went to Darwin because I knew the po the battalion was moving to Adelaide at the end of the year. So I was like, yeah, sweet, this is my ticket out. Of it's my way in. Way, way, way out of Darwin. Good, no, it was a way to get away from Townsville. Oh, that's true. So I picked yeah, Darwin anywhere with, with the hope that I'd get to Adelaide what, eventually. Are, what ones did you have to pick from? What unit? Pretty much Townsville and Darwin. Yeah, I was the same. So it was like, go to, the, go to Darwin and then with the hope of possibly going to Adelaide because the move had been postponed a few times. Do you know a bit? Uh, yeah, I'll yeah, grab that one. Um, so I went um, my first day we rocked up I was so bad now I think about it so it was we started on a Thursday I think it was or it was a Tuesday it was Tuesday and every Tuesday morning we used to do sport training yeah. so they're like alright sweet uh, go to whatever sport you like and we'll, um, we'll organise you to from there yeah. so we're like shit it's PT what do we wear so we went like <laughs> You Brown got, shirt with your my name, name across. across my chest. <laughs> no. Kapuka shorts on, oh, which the, is like these little the, tiny booty shorts. Those and are called those are called the Daisy Jukes of Freedom. Daisy Jukes of Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> so I rocked up and I was like, there was all of us with these. Sh oh, and everyone just looks at us like, who are these fuckwits? Yeah, like, they're all there in like normal like Adidas shorts and like battalion shirts. Yeah, like, and just like looking <laughs> looking mean as fuck. <laughs> and then there's like we're like these. Juby and like little new guys. Yeah. Um. So we from that um 
we as soon as that was over like we got changed and it was like back to like normal working days but we went to um we rocked up the battalion and like i remember like you get to you get to all right you're you're seven platoon eight platoon nine platoon that's how it was divvied up and so i was in nine platoon and they're like i just go speak to the sergeant who um i won't say who he is but i'm sure if he ever sees me talk about him he'll know who he is he was a bit of a fuckhead anyway but um he <laughs> gave me the line. paperwork to sign in right and so you get the paperwork so like your battalion march in paperwork and they're like go fill this out in the lunchroom and i sit down in the lunchroom and um I, I, i'm like trying to figure out like all right unit seven rar subunit fuck shit <laughs> excuse me is there a subunit excuse me what's what's a subunit he goes Wait, are you fucking talking to me lid I'm still like that <laughs> and, and that's that's the guy I, I, I was like excuse me like what's the subunit he goes are you fucking talking to me lid and i'm like oh, oh my god i'm gonna get bashed <laughs> shit like, but you hear all the stories so scared, all the man. stories about you guys going to units like i heard like at singer it's like i heard this went to god got to a unit and got like thrown off a balcony and sleep it didn't happen but like <laughs> but like there's all these like myths that come out Dude, of it. what oh, a battalion is like between, between the time i got to darwin mm. and like probably a year and a half later the battalion i reckon the whole army changed yeah like it, there was a major culture uh switch mm. and the, the whole army changed. restructure whatever it was no i, I yeah, think it was after the the incident at adva i think oh, a lot of yeah, stuff changed yeah, yeah. so i reckon i had it pretty tough at, uh sorry at singo yeah because i was at singo uh late to mid 2015 now my thought process on this was the hardest fighting we did in afghan was say between 2008 and 2012 anyone can pull me up on that if you think if you think i'm wrong but i'd say that's probably the four years of hardest yeah um so all the guys who would have been privates lance jacks will be coming full tracks Ride as hard as a singer, yeah, yeah. and that I reckon I just got smashed because of that. Because they'd seen first hand. I probably would have known some of those. The oh, you would have known. Them. I reckon you would have known all of them. There were some pretty um, infamous ones there. Yeah, I'll say that. Well, much. I, so the, this was the actual coolest thing about though. When I got to the battalion, and like you know, like the guy pulled me out saying he's talking to me, lid and all that. I actually knew a couple of people already there, which worked out really well. Mm. And on the first Friday night, it didn't matter who you were, you were in fight night. And so back in the day, they used to do Friday night fight nights, and it was the coolest thing ever. It was literally just because we everyone lived on base <laughs> in Darwin. It was you rock up to this spot in the in the living area, area living in areas, and a couple of guys have a bunch of gloves, and you just, everyone's just getting pissed, and you just call someone out, and you're like, "Oh, you, let's go," yeah. and you fight. And <laughs> and the, the secret is anymore. just getting amongst the boys. Mm. And then once it, that got me in with a lot of people because um, I held my. I just held my ground against a pretty fit guy. Yeah. And then the secret, and this is, you could be dumb as all fuck. You could be the dumbest person alive and you could rock up to the battalion and people will love you if you're fit as fuck. It yeah. Is, it is seriously the I'll secret. i two to, things, either fit as fuck or just one of the boys through and through. Yeah. But, but yeah, fit as fuck. Fit as fuck is yeah. easy. Like, if you can run... Like so, we do two point four kilometers, which is a mile and a half. Mm, yep. That's um, that's like one of our fitness tests. If you can do like a sub nine, yeah, um, sub two point four yeah. or a mile and a half, everyone just loves you. It doesn't matter if you're stupid, yeah. like if you're the smartest person, if you're cool or not. If you just, if you can just run fast, people love you. If you can do yeah. ninety plus push ups in two minutes, usually a hundred plus. Yeah, yeah, it's, I'd people, say hundred. Yeah, people love you. If you can get to the triple figures, like I've done that before when I was super fit people love you it's those are the gates to being legit in the military and it, it yeah. does because that when you come out a singer you just assumed you're stupid like it's just the, <laughs> there's no other gauge besides all right let's get him to run with something or let him let's get him to pull, pick something up and yeah. that's the only gauges they can have straight out of singer. there's a um, thing that stuck with me that says um in the infantry education is important but big biceps are important yeah. <laughs> i think that's pretty true but um I think one of the boys, so that helped me a lot because I was never one of the fitter dudes. I'd always held my own. Like, I was always mid-pack fitness. Not not anymore, but um, not after this. But um, fucking, like, while I was in. Well, I was, I'm still in, but while I was really active. Um, but being one of the boys helped me a lot. You know, going out with the guys, sort of getting in with those more senior dudes. And I remember I did... Um, pretty much my first exercise the bunghole challenge yeah so yeah. in the um, we have our 24 hour ration packs but then we have in our vehicles 24 uh, sorry a five man ration pack yeah will come to like big things to actually cook up and they have these massive like, christmas cakes christmas cakes like a big pudding in a thing and the thing is to get guys you've got a minute 
You get a free It's like your opening tool Your fucking ridiculous eating device Yeah You got that You need it You've got one minute To open it and eat it with your hand Or you have to finish it In a plank <laughs> Yeah And I remember being in front This is like but, And then when, you, when you're when you eating And in the on the plank You <laughs> have to like, use your hand Yeah oh, it's just And hands. if you drop anything You've got to eat it got Off to, the ground Yeah And I remember um Straight up being like It was like first week It's like Willie you're doing the bunghole challenge. I don't even know what it was. I'm like, oh no. And I had to verse um, one of the, oh, I won't say his name, but one of the boys at the time who was a more senior dude. And I, I was so shit at it. Like I'm shit at those eating challenges. But I remember I had like all my hands cut up and everything from like the outside of it. And it didn't even make me finish because I was just bleeding it. It's just like eating it. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, he's good. Let him in. Like he, he, That's sick. Um, and I think that's one of my big tips is sort of be one of the boys. Yeah. Um, or it was not one of the boys. Sort of in with the, in with the guys be involved like don't just sort of sideline yourself yeah and and it's it's a really scary and difficult moment because like i'm not a really extroverted kind of person mm-hmm. like i might have come across my persona on twitch a lot like that but to me i'm i'm kind of like i keep to myself a lot mm-hmm. so for me to be like out with the boys all the time is really difficult um see i'm the exact opposite <laughs> yeah so it's someone like willie gets along quite well quite quickly with a lot of people for me I went down the more fitness route. I was like just super fit. People would, like mm. see me running, and they used to call me triceps. Yeah. Uh, and so like they'd be like, "Oh, there's triceps," because <laughs> like no one knows your name. They yeah. just pick a feature and they just go with it. Like mm. you know, you know. Yeah, like, that's why I'm called Willie. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna, I will claim it. But yeah. And that's that's literally like so they just picked my triceps and they said mm. that's triceps and like that was that was only early on, but um you know like it's just it's a scary time first time in the battalion. But oh shit! Yeah, do you one, remember your first day? Yeah, like that. Pretty fondly, yeah. It just sticks with everyone, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, but I think the the way overall, it, it your first years like getting into it, and mm. then after that, it kind of just it all just happens really quickly. And yeah, you're finally you're, doing your job. You're not training anymore. It's like we're gonna go clear this objective yeah. on on an exercise. We're gonna clear this compound. You're like, oh, I know how to do that. Like at the start, you're almost shy. You're like, I. I don't want to go through the door first on an exercise at Coltan or something because I might fuck it up. He might look look bad. I might look bad. I want to look really perfect. And then... Then you realise that the corporals don't know shit either. When you're a senior dude, you're like, fuck it. Don't <laughs> let's see how this goes. Like, Let's give it a crack. What, what can go wrong? The army's a really fucked up place too for the fact that... So you're only as smart as the people that have taught you your job, really. <laughs> and so if you got taught really poorly... And then three years later, you now have to teach the next person and you have to, like you're teaching your poorly taught techniques to the next person. Mm. It's a really bad, bad, like follow on effect. Yeah, it can and, snowball. And a lot of people are very lazy when it comes to like maintaining their skills in the military and don't really try and pers- pursue for excellence. Yeah, um, I think that's a, a, a bit of a worry to of that. And as a, like, so a lot of people will be like classed as senior digs and... They're senior purely based off time, not off knowledge. Yeah. Um, and so you're really just getting told, oh, follow this guy's lead. And he's just been around for three years, but he's still just been a number one gunner, just carrying the gun, getting told where to go the whole time. And now mm. he's now telling you what to do. Yeah. And you get a lot of people pissed off at that because you see the young guys who are really driven and really want to know their job and pursue uh, that sort of pursuit of excellence. They start getting courses and promoted and everything before these senior guys. And that creates a bit of a rift. Like that guy's been in... 12 months yet he's on a specialist course I've been in 4 years and I've never got one like there's a fucking reason for that yeah um, And but then there's, there's that is it angst is the word where people mm. will just like oh like I fucking hate that person mm. and it's it's, it's it's like that's why the military is a world totally different to anywhere else really it's like schoolyard politics oh, that that's how I explain that's honestly how I explain the army to people it's like year 12 but everyone gets paid a, a decent salary and we all live together the Australian <laughs> like, army is the second highest paid in the army in the world behind yeah, Canada, Canada yeah but I think we, we chop and change all we the time. technically we make more money in the Australian army but the Canadian cost of living is less oh, that so that's sense. where it really makes them number one yeah yeah for sure yeah it's a it's a different world I, oh, I haven't been I'm not out but like because I've been on a lot of sick leave, I really miss it though. Do you miss it or not? I won't go into details, so, but you got fucked around a, yeah, lot, of, so a lot in your last couple the, of years because I, I knew you fairly well. And I remember coming in, probably my most, or one, probably the second most um, memorable thing I did with you was I came into work at one time at like 11 o'clock at night once um, and you were on guard 
And I remember walking in because I needed to sign out keys to go through and get something out of my cage or whatever. And you just being like, oh, oh Willie, yeah, oh, what's up, man? Like, oh, I'm fucking off this. Like, and like <laughs> this person get fucked, this person get fucked. And I'm pretty new at the time. I've been there two years. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess they can get fucked. Like, so, so guard duty is the most fun thing you'll ever do in the mm. military. So once Best you get ever. paid, like, say, 60 grand a year to be in the military... If you break that down hourly. <laughs> <laughs> so guard duty is like, you can get told you're on guard the same day you're doing it, right? And it is literally sitting there. When you have rank, you sit there in front of a phone for 24 hours. Yep. You don't do anything else. You sit there and you get four hours sleep. And if you're a digger, you get to sit, stand out in front of the, the gate mm. for about six hours of the day, signing in cars. And you do that for pretty much 24 hours. And... It is the worst thing possible. It's the biggest waste of life possible. And I, oh, I hated it so much. And I used to get mm. it all the time. Yeah. Or, as a rank, it, with rank, you there, you wanna, there was no way of getting around it. See, I had a very, very, um, I'd say successful career. I mean, as far as like, I got into the unit, went a lot of field, a lot of courses, deployed, came back, got sick, been off. Guess how many guards I've done? Oh, probably fucking four three yeah and i one of them was i was filling in for a mate because his missus had a car crash that was she was fine she had a car crash that morning i went in in polys everything and they're like oh willie what are you doing i'm like i'm filling in for whoever and they're like oh fuck you're a good bloke and go home (laughs) so i've done two guards and you know i've never stood in the box at the front no fuck that i I, I, (laughs) did get on courses you don't have to do it i did way back in the day but the thing was when i got back from indonesia it was totally different call game Oh, so, yeah. we'll, we'll fast forward to the four year mark of my career, which yeah. is where Willie is right now. So, um, <laughs> Lid. the biggest thing that happens around your four year mark is yeah. everyone leaves. Yeah. Right. It's a bit of a, a loss of tribe. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. So, my experience, really dra- dra- experience dramatically reduced in enjoyment at my four year mark in the battalion because everyone who signs up signs a four year contract. And at that point, most people start getting out. Yeah, um, the retention rate is quite low. It's something that needs to be looked into. And um, this is where the the knowledge doesn't get retained either, because you don't really get the people that want to be there staying around and experience. So Guys who have done it and been there and got out. Yeah. I, w- I always used to rep- uh, re- uh, refer to the military very similar to um, to warehousing. So when you are in warehousing the supervisors are usually people that have been in warehousing for like 20 30 years and they've never really strive to do anything besides warehousing and then like all the people that are workers are just like guys that just rocked up trying to make some money and get get on with their life yeah so a lot yeah. of people that are, are smart in the military get the fuck out and start their own life careers passions mm. etc mm. and the guys that either get married and have kids and they've got restrictions to their life so they need to make money yeah and then the other people which are um uh what do you call it uh, they don't know anything better to do with their life so they just mm. stick around and they're not really the best of the crop. While you're on that, not to cut you off, but sort of uh, sort of put into that, I was speaking to a, a well-known guy in the army, I, I won't say his name again, but he was saying the guys, the infantry ends up sometimes with really bad people because the guys who can succeed in the outside world, who would really succeed me CEOs, well, will either go special forces or they'll get out and be successful. Yep. And we lose all those top people. Yep. Um, so those people who'd be fantastic and there's no incentive and to stay and that's the thing I, I know a lot of people who reach those higher tiers like well what do I do now uh, well you can do it in the course it's like but I've already done this course like you're sitting here in your recon jump up and you've done your promotion course it's like well what do you do now it's like well oh you just go through the ranks and it's like well <laughs> what now um, and money's and not, like not, not, not enough drive you can't just money, give someone nah, money not, not for the implications it can put on your life like i've had a fantastic career and a very successful career i would think but if it was for money i would have been working at maccas yeah. if i worked at the maccas down the road from me the amount of hours i've put into this job i'd be a millionaire yeah um no one does it for money i don't think you can be an infantryman for if money. you're in after four years you're not doing it for the money no nah, no nah, not at all um so around my four year mark i pretty much everyone deployed to afghan except for me Mm. Like that's pretty Which much. Which is a hard thing to do. Yeah, I so in recon, I went for special forces that year, and my whole recon platoon pretty much deployed except for me. But I got, I got put in a really awkward situation where they they'd already promised 
deployment to a lot of people mm-hmm. and then pulled it up. Pulled Did you get promised? It, yes. Yeah. And they pulled it back on a lot of people. And then, um, so when that happened, I put my application in for special forces and I went for special forces. They said, pull your application for special forces, we'll send you to Afghan as part of Guardian Angels. Mm. And I said, I can't change my career path based off a promise. Yeah. Because unless you actually say, here's the manning, this is you on it, you're on your, on this is your flight. I ain't, yeah. I ain't taking that risk because yeah. special forces takes a lot of look at why you pull applications and stuff like that. Yeah, if you put it in the promise of the trip, it doesn't look. Yeah, and I'd already good. this. I wasn't at just like day one of application. I was like months in. Yeah, and they would look and you go, well, are you serious about joining? Are you serious about being an infantry? About being a, you know, deploying, or are you serious about joining the special forces? Yeah, like which one do you want? You've chosen this. Fuck off. And so I picked. I picked special forces, and they gave my position to another person. Uh, which it w- so I would have actually had a trip, mm. um, and so then the following year we got called up and like as in the battalion got called up and said oh we're actually man- manning another trip, mm. and I, the person that picked the manning for the trip knew that I picked special forces over the battalion, so he oh, made sure I didn't go on the trip it again. No. And as soon as that happened, my whole intention said, well if I'm going to stick around in the military, I want to do something with my, my career, and that's where I started looking into linguistics. And I put my application in to go to school of languages to study Indonesian, and I got to go to school of languages and learn Indonesian for twelve months, mm. which I was re- really lucky there actually because yeah, you halfway were. through my course I got selected to go and live in Indonesia for six months, which is actually paid more than the deployment. So yeah, I got six months in a Southeast Asian country yeah. with everything paid for, and and I know that's something you're massive because I remember pretty much from I can't remember the first time I met you, but. It was always like you're always your passion was in linguistics and Indonesian, like it's always been a massive driver for you. I think it's always about bettering myself, man. Like but, yeah, life yeah. skills and just I, I've always been. I can't. I'm not the guy that sits down and just like can play on my phone all day. Mm. I'm always doing stuff. Like even when I was in the battalion, like guys would sit on their phones all day, and I'd be like, mm. "What can I do? Like, I could go to the gym or go for a swim, or I would just be the guy that always wanted to do something." Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying it can be it can be a hard life. Like, oh, the way I sort of explain the infantry to people is we do like the least amount of work, nine percent of the time, but then we make up for that in that ten percent. Yeah. So nine percent of the time we're not doing much because we, we unless we're out unless it's we're a, unless not, we're on a, a high range, rank. it's a high rank still. Unless we're on a range or we're out in the field, we can't do much. Yeah. The, the ranks doing stuff so we can go, um, and then when we're out there though, we work the hardest, the longest. In Whatever. the worst conditions. In the worst conditions, by far, you live from your pack. Um, if you've got your pack. Um, and that, that's that's it. So it's sort of, you make up for it here and there. Um, but it can be a frustrating gig um, for people who sort of want to be on that daily grind of bettering themselves. can be like, well, why am I coming in to sit around? And that can, that can be hard. Yep. And I know I've, I've ran into a bit of that recently because I'm sort of on my return to work sort of schedule as such like i'm coming in as much as i can with my health and it's been like shit this is like I, I, if i were here i'd be doing something for my media or something for charity or whatever it's hard but i'm just sitting here doing nothing <laughs> like but it's something i guess i guess you get used to but it is a good life like i would say like that first maybe year in battalion fuck that was epic like, because I came with, I want to just throw out to you because you're with the boys. Eh? Yeah, I lived on base. I lived actually across from you. Where from my room, I could look out my window down to the yeah, right, that's right, and you had I all these you. posters and shit on your wall. Um, and we got on it pretty hard, and yeah. it was epic. Like you'd go to work, you'd sort of play hard at work, play harder on the weekend. We did that. And that um, was just your life. It was a, it was a spiral of good shit. Yeah, like nothing ever went wrong for me. I know things can get, can go wrong for guys. Like I know a lot of guys started getting into a bit of strife sometimes I never did and I guess that's sort of why I've got such fond memories I think um, I was with a pretty good bunch of dudes too guys I, I do miss now they're out you got to remember also that people that join the, the army particularly the infantry they're not always educated people either like they're people no. from every way of life oh, there could be people that everything. come from broken homes or that are like you know raised themselves and then mm. they got people that are like came from really well off ham- families and I know and, a guy who was in jail for drugs like for, like um not possession but like um what's it called when you like selling them um dealing like, like dealing drugs got was in like prison for it or some yeah. shit and then he's in the army clean as fuck yeah. legend but like it's such different backgrounds so everyone is totally different so mm. 
Um, it, it's it's really it's just a mixture of people, and it's just different. It's it's just so many different types of people yeah. in the same area, and so it's never a smooth sailing place. There's, no, particularly with rank. Like I remember, like getting phone calls from people and like, yeah, yeah, you need to come into work. Like you fucked up. You know, like yeah. I, I remember, like there was in the year 2015, we had two people go to prison from our battalion. Did we? Yeah, from um, one guy. There was both. They were both in fights. One of them oh, knocked yeah. someone out, and um, it was it was kind of self defense, but mm. not. He took it a little bit too far. Caught, mm. Got himself in prison for oh, it, okay. and then another one actually just belted up someone, and you know, like you got high testosterone young people on the piss. Yeah. It's, oh it's, yeah. Young guys were taught to fight, if, if that makes sense. Like, you're not taught physically. Okay. Oh, you are taught to a degree, but I guess your job people sort of reflect that. And it, it, yeah, that's that's the people get that sort of big dog attitude. I know when I was at Singo, we weren't allowed to walk on the footpaths because the footpaths were for people to clap us by because we're the infantrymen. <laughs> Did you ever have that? <laughs> I had that. Yeah, it was like you ought to walk on the road because the footpaths are for people on Anzac Day to clap you as you go past as a beret on because you're a fucking big dog. And that's cool at the time, but it doesn't translate too well in civic world. No. Um, because it's like you go out in the town, I'm an 18-year-old dude. I'm not smart enough to see that as training in real life. You think that's your life the whole time. And you go out in the town with water balance under your arms, like, fuck yeah, I'm big dog. Like, you ought to be on the, I'm be on and the road and you've got to clap me as you go past. I think it's important for the infantry, though. Yeah. I think that shit is. Because you need that attitude. At the end of the day, I'm not, I know we're not doing it now, at all but the infantry are still the dudes who could go over the top of a trench mm-hmm. and a lot of people are like oh we need you know oh they're so uneducated blah 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 and like you got these sort of toxic toxic males like um, real grunt guys and I put it to them like well at the end of the day who would you really want fighting for your country would you want this six foot five dude who's just a fucking weapon um, or some skinny weedy greeny like that's sort of and i put it to them like at the end of the day i know you might not like that person but if you were in a war i know who i'd be standing behind i think i agree to the to the most most of that um i think the the problem and this is going to be anyone in chat who's going through recruitment it really comes down to recruitment man oh mate yeah recruitment fuck it something chronic oh bro you have so, I, have a, I have a good mate in recruitment at the moment and he's like, bro, you don't know half of it. <laughs> so the thing is like recruitment have numbers. Like recruitment yeah. go, all right, we need to get 300 people in infantry, 100 drivers, 15 clerics and like, I don't know, one pilot. They, they have a quota of what we need. They got a quota of what they're going to recruit. Mm. So their job isn't to find the best person yeah. for each job. There is, we have to fill these numbers and we've got three months to do it. But on that too, recruitment is not defense run it's a no, private it's, it's a private company under the banner of defense force recruiting yeah and that's why we have and a couple they, of uh, military people there yeah and they are paid per recruit they get through the training so the military pay oh you've got willie and paul into these infantry positions here's money for them so they're they're a business they, they get paid by pushing people through so they will push people through and that's the reason sometimes you can end up with um with bad eggs i guess like there's some people that should one. never have gotten through the front door you and me have a a um let's say mutual Friend. Acquaintance. <laughs> Acquaintance. I didn't want to say friend. Um, who may be infamous for, you know, section attack of your mind, sex staring down the barrel of a machine gun. So, like, the stupid thing is, like, like, <laughs> like, I, was, I was blessed in the military with probably three of the worst people in the battalion. I don't know why they did it to me. Don't say names, but I know. I know all three, I think. Do I, I know all three? Oh, no, one was before you. Oh, okay. Or do I definitely know two of them then. Yeah, you definitely know two. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know how you... how some of these people make it but it's just oh bro I don't know how they oh. like the, uh, anyway right. the, the point I'm trying to make is recruitment failed the, the military yep. the biggest yep. because they've got a quota they're trying to meet their quota but at the end of the day it's like you're actually losing government money in it too which yep. is really annoying and, but, and just making it harder for you and me at the other end yeah <laughs> the corporals have got to try and train them yeah well, some people are literally untrainable yeah so okay well, well, doesn't mean they're bad people We'll move towards now. So for, mm. for me, like I got out, but what's your future in the military at the moment? This is a really hard question. I think I'm getting asked this a lot by the military as well. Yeah. Because um, there's a difference between what I want to do, what the military see me doing, and what may actually happen. <laughs> um, I want to go back to my job full time. Now, 
I know I might talk a bit of shit on the army, um, but I think the support they've given me through this, and I, I, a lot of people disagree with this who have been through the medical systems in the army, and I think that's partially maybe due to them, but I actually put it mostly due to the personnel. Like you have to push it, and you can if you know the hoops jump through, you can get it to work. Um, and the way the battalion, my unit, the seven arrows looked after me, it's been incredible. Now, I want to go return to work. Um, in a full capacity, I don't want to be some, I don't want to be that guy with cancer at the unit. I know it might be hard to step around that, but that's not who I want to be. I just want to be a digger again. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that's what I want to do. What the military see me doing, they're sort of unsure because it, I'm in a weird space. Most people who are downgraded to the point I am, which downgrading for those is a medical um, grading where you put people of like how healthy you are, um, not physical, no, oh, no, sorry, not physical not like um health is in how many push-ups you can do is in like do you have a bad knee or a bad whatever and your health so it's a physical or mental illness you can get downgraded for yeah now the problem with me is i have no symptoms symptoms like my my brain tumor was picked up for those of you don't know i have a a, um, 42 millimeter brain tumor on my left frontal lobe which can cause me could cause me a potential seizure um or maneuverability in my right side but i've never had a symptom it was picked up by accident um, now the problem is they're like if Willie didn't go into the hospital that day for a sore shoulder would end up picking up this we would never know and he'd still be working fine doing everything it's sort of uh, it's in a weird zone because it's like well are we willing to take that risk with no symptom if someone's got no leg it's like well there's the symptom that's it with me it's like nothing's wrong except the potential of things the potential's massive the risk is huge but nothing's actually happening. Um, and the way I think they're looking at it is like, it's got to go to a mech review board with doctors and whatever. Um, and not only doctors, but a employment um, sort of specialists. Yep. Of like, where do we see you fitting in? Now, I want to go back to work. My rank on the on the green side of army, um, on the on the infantry man side, is like, we want Willie back. There's no reason he can't do the job. He's done everything before with this tumour. I mean, he can do everything again with the tumour. The civilian sort of employment side of the army is like, nah, he's too much of a risk. And then sort of my career, that's what I want to continue into. What I think will happen is eventually my position may be terminated. I'll be separated from defence. Um, on no bad terms, nothing. It might just be like, look, Willie, we aren't willing to take this on. Um, because it's a pretty easy thing for them to say what if you have a seizure in in afghanistan the chances of that happening are fucking tiny but they'll come back with art but you admit there's a chance and i can't really refute that um that's a hard one um and i'm not sure i'm wanting my career to progress because i was on such a good thing like i came back from afghan did sub two which is psyos which is a promotional course for corporal i was put on um sub one which is a promotional course for lance corporal should have been promoted Every, everything was going like green lights to me the whole way and then this has just been like a stop sign so it's a it's a weird one because like where would you if, if someone with a brain tumor was in your section and you had overall control and it was like the potential of what he could have is up to this but he's got no symptoms it's like a weird it's almost like i'm not trying to mean they don't know what they're doing but it's in such a gray area it's like we've never dealt with yeah something and for like them, I this think it's, like I, I know the military mindset pretty well now and it's pretty much they'd just be like it's easier just to push it to the side and into the let's not worry about it and just take it as he just sits on the side than mm-hmm. actually to run a risk because everything in the military yeah. runs a risk assessment doesn't matter how small or big they run a yeah. risk assessment yeah. on it everything and Willie being a low risk of a seizure is a high catastrophic event if yeah. in the right, wrong situation. Like if he's driving, the, you know, like because you're a crew commander for yeah. a um, for a bushmaster. Bushmaster, bushmaster. Protecting right. mobility vehicle, yeah. So he'd be driving this, you know, what, how much they were, like 15 ton? 15, 16, yeah. I think battle load, I think battle laden 16, I think. Yeah. He could be driving so that, that 60, that. sorry, 80 to 100k an hour, which is like 60 mile an mm. hour, and have a seizure. seizure and then fuck well not only that like if we're on a section patrol and eight guys and i go down with a seizure next thing we've got four stretcher bearers yeah and three other dudes on the ground to do anything and so <sighs> so the way the military would think is just it's just not worth the risk yeah so i'm um that's what i want to do i'm infantry through and through like yeah. that that's just what i want to do 
Um, 100%. I, I had aspiration to go special forces. I think most infantry guys do. But that was my aspiration. I think that's the passion still there. I'm not sure if the physical ability is there anymore. Um, or even the almost, or probably even the emotional ability anymore. Um, because it is a hard thing to look down the barrel of after going through a lot of hard shit. Yep. Um, so I'm not really sure. I, I'm Time will tell, sort of in the next six months. Um, I've got a few more scans and shit to come back um, about how we go. But at the moment, the green side of army, my rank, is like really take your time, do what you need to come back. Uh, and uh, one of my bosses the other day was like, do not feel pressured, Willie, to come. Like, don't feel like you're under pressure. If you just, if you ring up and like, I'm too sick to come into work today, don't feel like you're being a dick because we all understand. And I think on a personal relation with the rank, I've had such a good experience. Yeah, uh, I know a lot of people have a bad experience, um, and I put that down to two sides. Everything has two sides, but like, oh, I've had a fantastic experience. I know, I know you've been fucked around a bit because we were good mates when it happened. But in my case, I think a lot of people, um, I think there was no question in mind where some people can question things. I know you're 100 percent kosher, you're legit, but I think there was almost from someone who doesn't know you can question like oh why are you doing this with with a different brigade where mine is sort of everyone went well no, well we're not going to question willie's fucking brain tumor yeah willie do what you want yeah like i, I think if that makes sense yeah so and and this is going to be a really hard thing for you to ever move past in life i think because mm. i think the word stigma is like something that, that defines you yeah so you're always going to be known as the guy with brain cancer now yeah fucking um right. and and this is where when i left the military as well um the first thing i did is i so, well, I saved up a heap of money and then I took by a heap of money I, I probably had about four or five thousand dollars and I moved out to the country with my now wife at the time girlfriend and I said I am not doing anything to do with military for, for three months ever for three months um, and so I bought a, I stole my dad's boat I legit just drove over to his house 600 <laughs> so 800 kilometers away and dro- just drove away with it and then I, um, I started fishing and playing computer games and streaming and and this is why even with my streaming, like I really don't talk too much about the military. Like mm. I know I'm talking about it here now with you, but when people ask me questions about my military experience, I talk about it and then I move on. And you don't actually see like, I think in my you about me section on Twitch, yourself, I don't let the military define mm. me as a person. Cause I, I really yeah. don't think, I really don't like those kind of stigmas on anyone really. Cause Willie, if like, I know you guys, people from my channel at least, uh, Willie is a really just outgoing, fun, awesome bloke. Like, you know, you jump out of planes, you, sure, you know, you go f- that shit. Four yeah. wheel, you're four wheel driving, you're always just having a blast with life. But that's sort of my whole thing is I'm, I've lived like that and I don't want let, to let cancer change me. Exactly. My, my, like my tagline on Instagram, which is really, really been cancer the same as this, is a redefining terminal illness. And yeah. that's what I want to do is I want to show people like, you can do this with this illness. And, Sorry and, to cut you off, yeah. No, that's good, man. And, and and so for me, with leaving the military, I didn't want that stigma. It's like, oh, he's mm. ex-military. Because that's all everyone thinks these days. It's like, yeah. oh, ex-serviceman and all that. Like, I like the idea of I live my life how I want to live it, and that's why I left. And mm. um, I really think, even if you do leave the military and you still love that, you still would have loved to be in there, you can still live life to the fullest with the time that we still have. Oh, you fuck know? yeah. And, and I think um, a lot of people in the military get scared and, and in the comfort zone mm. uh, I'm not saying Willie's in that boat at all but uh, a lot of guys stay in the military for a lot longer than they probably should because yeah. they're scared of not getting a good job or yeah. um, trying out new things like I never thought I'd be a Twitch streamer I never yeah, thought it's anything insane. like that like, like over time I remember when you first you came to visit me I, was, I got really sick on chemotherapy one day for a couple of weeks and I probably hadn't seen you in a good 6-12 months yeah, I, I'd wild. say 12 months um, and all came to visit me in, in hospital um, and I was like, oh, what are you doing with yourself? Well, I'm actually streaming um, like computer online games. on computer games. On, and I'm like, what? Like, what do you, is, is that a thing? Like, like, what do you mean you do this for a career? Um, like, not not to diss it, but I had no idea. Um, no one does. My mum's still figuring it out. But my parents have no idea. My, I know my parents probably listen to this and they're like, why? <laughs> like, what do you mean people watch someone play video games? I'm like, nah, it's like this new thing. <laughs> like, But it's cool. But yeah, that, that comfort zone. I think people do get caught in that comfort zone. You can have a very cruisy career and get paid the same. Um, and I think that is another reason people actually end up leaving the military is they're like, hang on, I'm working so hard, doing all this, I'm so passionate, yet I get paid the exact same as this bloke who doesn't give a shit. 
who's been in Sydney for 10 years getting paid the same. Yeah. Um, and that can be a hard one. The reason I'm still passionate is I still have that aspiration. One, I want to be a corporal. Um, I, I want. I always wanted to leave as a full track in the army. It, I don't know why, it's just a thing. And so I always had that aspiration to be special forces. Um, yeah. And that's a hard thing to give up. You know, I've thought about that for... 10 years if not more that's what I wanted to do like that was and, and there was a time where I was like I don't want to leave the military without going to Afghan or Iraq yeah and because particularly around my five six year mark mm. I was really like I really want to go to Afghan or Iraq so I can at least say I've been mm. you know and I'm going to be really frank here the Australian army particularly the, well the, the Australian infantry Grants, guys yeah. over in Afghan and Iraq at the moment whilst they're doing a really awesome job in the fact that they're putting serving for their country over there a list of the trips that I know my mates were over there for, they described it to me as they weren't really doing much at all. Besides but to put on that, that's not the boys' fault. The no, guys want to be. The fault. guys want to go out and do their job. I know, and that's, that's where I would yeah. really struggle in Afghan too, because yeah. I was talking about before. I, I always want to do as much as I can. Um, I would be sitting over there, just like, come on, can we do a patrol? Can we do something? Yeah, I, I said about this on um, one of the podcasts I did about that with Life on the Line podcast was like, we didn't. We went there not to do the job we wanted, but fuck, we did a good job of the job we did. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you're right, the guys and guys get out because it's like, well, what am I going to do? Like, we're not going to get this trip. Fuck it. Like, yeah. And and, and, and it's really difficult for someone like me that was in six year at the six year mark. I was like working my ass off trying to mm. be the best soldier I could be, and they're like, ah, oh, no, you've missed the next trip, and you're like, what? Yeah, like when's the next one? Three years. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm going to wait another three more years and. Yeah. Then might miss that one too, and it's just it's really painful. And oh, it, a it, lot it, of guys yeah. got out. It's really not an easy thing. Let down. Yeah, well, and, and infantry guys just want to want to like go out on patrol. That's all we want. Yeah. You hear those? Oh, go out and go to Afghan, Iraq patrol, and it's just not happening at the moment. And I think that's a hard one. If you actually look, and this is this is a fact, and I'm going to bring up my opinion on this: the morale of the army the last few years is the lowest it's ever been, including the world wars, Vietnam, the height of Iraq, Afghan. It's the lowest now. Because the guys aren't doing what they're trained to do. It's like it's like footy training and sitting on the sitting on the bench. A lot of the time, I'll say my Afghan trip was the easiest thing I've ever done. Now there were parts in that that challenged me to no end, and mainly that's because of my position was completely out of my depth. I had yep. no idea what I was doing. I won't say no idea what I was doing. <laughs> Some people might say I had no idea what I was doing. Most ninety percent would say really had fucking no idea. But I was like the only private soldier who was a crew commander. Everyone else was a full track, yep. um, or at least a, a lance corp. I think I think they're all full tracks though. Um, and I think. What I got out of my tour was was growing up for me. Was like it wasn't the old school Afghan. You see, it was the you're in charge. Of this you've got to make a decision on this point. And I was like, holy shit, this is a new step in my career. And I think that's more what I got. But the easiest part of my career was deploying. Yeah, going field's fucking hard. Yeah, like yeah, fuck. Because they're I training sl- for a I war, slept not in a, the war. I or slept whatever. in a bed every night. See, like, in, in all honesty, if I could have done any of the trips that were happening when I was in, would have been, would have been Iraq, and I would have yeah. liked to train Dajin, the, Iraqi, yeah. the Iraqi forces. Yeah, oh, you'd be good at that. Because, like, I like teaching people stuff. Like, mm. I make guides all the time. Yeah. I, I, and I would learn um, Ar- Arabic during mm. I would go out of my way to learn it. Yeah. That's the kind of person I am, and yeah. I try and teach as much as I could without the translator. Mm. So... That's just... It's just how you are, I guess. But it's just, it's just unfortunate. Like, you, you put so much time and effort into a job and you never get there. And so when you do yeah. get out, you feel this disappointment in yourself that you never got to do your actual job. Yeah. And at, yeah. and for me, leaving the battalion without a trip to uh, the Middle East, and, mm. like, anyone who's here currently listening or in, my, uh, or in the chat right now, just pay attention to how many people ask me hey, how many times did you go to the Middle East or when did you go to the mm. Middle East. Yeah, yeah. And it is such a, it's the first question people ask me. Just watch that. I'm going to go take a piss. Go it's all it, this man. beer. <laughs> That's right. It's all the beers so killing the, me. Like, you'll notice it a lot when people go, um, uh, what do you call it? People go, oh, did you go to Iraq? Did you go to Afghan? And it, it's like the first question people ask me all the time is, hey, Pestoli, did you serve? I'm like, yep, eight years in infantry. Dude, uh, when did you go to the Middle East? Or when did you, where did you do uh, deployments? Or when? And it's just like, I don't know. You know, like, I, I spent most of my time in Southeast Asia as a translator for the last four years of my career. So it's a, it's a lot more different. I'll look at the chat here now. I never see that question. Well, you probably never in my chat then unturned. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a difficult situation, but I don't hold it against. Um, I, I, I still love the fact that I did the military time and I don't regret it at all. For me, it's myself. Um, I learned more about myself in the military and maybe the person I am today with 
with all the time that I spent in the military, uh, which has been really good for me because now I know what a hard day's work is. And I'm not saying that people out there don't know what a hard day's work is, but trust me, like when you do a 72 hour straight digging exercise when you've done nothing but digging, you know what you know what hard work is, and like it it, it can be quite brutal. Um, so it's just it's just a a way of life. Um, yeah. So we've been gas bagging now for a good hour ten. Oh, that's right. We're getting there. I think we should probably just before we jump into questions. I want to look at what the next five years entails for yourself. For me, it's quite easy because people know mine's unclear. <laughs> yeah, I might be. Well, different. actually, I'll, I'll, I'll turn this back on you real quickly. So, hmm. um, what is your your expected time frame? This is a weird thing. If you Google it, it's five to seven years. Yeah. <laughs> now, the problem with um, averages and anyone out there who's ever got an average from a doctor of something, those averages are a mean. They're an average of everyone. They're an average of someone who's got a tumour like mine and died next week. They have to account that of a 10-day living or they have to take into the account of someone who's got my tumour like mine and live for 20 years. So if someone, if to make an average of, let's just say, seven years, someone who's lived for a week, that means someone has to live for 20 years to counteract that average. Um, and also in this, they have to take into account it's an average person. And this is what one of the doctors says to me. He's like, if you think in a community, really, an average person... He's like, you're young, you're 20, you've lived a pretty fit, healthy life so far. Like, I drink a he bit. He drinks a lot. I drink a bit. A lot. <laughs> Very much. But I walk in and he hands me a beer as I walk through the door. Don't you, don't, don't you worry, chat. And that's happened for the last four years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's why I, I everyone likes him. But I'm not an alcoholic. That's why everyone Sally likes me. He's like, Willie's where we drink. Willie goes out every Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's one of the um, boys' boys. We talked one of the, about this before. One of the boys' boys. But, but um, at the end of the day... An average is average. So there's kids with this who have a very poor survival rate and through to people who are 80 with this. And that's where these are such bullshit numbers because they take into account everyone. It's like, you are not an average person in society. If you're 20, you're fit, you're healthy, you've lived a pretty fit and healthy life, I won't... And the doctors will not give you a time... At least me did not give me a time frame. They will tell you, Google says this, the medical books say this, but they say also to get that time frame means people have to die for that to come. So if we have an average of seven years in 2019, that average has to be taken from 2012. So that average is seven years of technology, of medicine, of everything old. Now there's a lot of talk about brain cancer at the moment. It's one of the big sort of, um, it's been in the news a lot. Um, and they're like, we don't know what's happened in the last five or 10 years. Well, we do know, but we don't know the outcome, total outcome of this. Um, and it's it's one of those hard ones. But I think it's given me a perspective on, well, fuck. Like, I always knew I was never going to live forever. <laughs> no one does. But, but you almost have this thing, especially in Australia, we're incredibly lucky. I'd say the luckiest country in the world, honestly. Um, of, well, I'll get my 84 years, whatever the expected age for a male is and for them to go look to be honest it, nah <laughs> it's like holy shit and I think um, I've always sort of lived life to the fullest like you said before I've just I just do shit um, and that's where everything had to change for me it's like fuck well I'm not going to buy a house anymore I'm going to buy a fucking sick WRX Subaru yeah. that sounds epic because I'm not going to pay off a mortgage in the rest of my life fuck that um, and I'm just going to start doing shit now chemo's held me back a lot um, but that's one of those one of those things, I guess, in the next, just living out as well as I can. And I'm just trying to show that it's not... People think of cancer as people who are sick in hospital, no air, sick. And they're a, a victim of it. Yeah. And I want to show that, no, 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 we're just... We're fucking unlucky. We're in a sort of a poker game of life and we've accidentally just fucking lucked out. And we've got this mutation on us. It doesn't mean we're sickly, useless people. <laughs> we can do fucking heaps of shit. And I think that's sort of something I'm trying to change and I think people are sort of grabbing onto that a little bit anyway and the mental health struggle that comes with it yeah mm. it's changed so, me a lot like I know you but see like with me you know with me the, pretty well and you would have said holy shit he's a lot fucking more mature now than yeah. like I'm sitting here with you doing this last like eight, well, eight months ago I would have been at the London Hotel <laughs> drinking what four dollar Jager night? bombs yeah, it's Friday night yeah, so I we don't might know actually go to this night. after this Heavy drunk by now. four dollar Jagers three dollar base spirits at the London so for me like after I quit the army, I was like, I want to, the reason why, one of the main reasons is, I'm not going to go into the details of the reason why I quit, mm. 
but one of the major reasons was I was always living on the army's time scale and schedule. Like, you take holiday here, you do this here and then and where. Mm. So for me, I was like, okay, I want to quit and I want to start living life how I want to live it. Because mm. I've always been big on traveling, enjoying life, yeah. being passionate about what I do. Always. So for me, like, I, won't, I don't know five years. I know next year. Next year, I'm going to Europe. Willie's going to be tagging along for as oh, much of it as he can fit. We're allowed to talk about that? Yeah, man. Oh, good. I, I didn't know if we were allowed to talk about that. I didn't know if the, your, your followers knew. No, nah, so... Oh, um, so I'm coming, yeah. <laughs> Willie's coming to, to Europe with me. Um, we don't know for how long of it, depending on how his treatment goes. But if he can come for the whole trip, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. I'll be... January, I'll be going to Europe. So I'm going to be streaming for the rest of the year, just like normal, every day of the week, um, playing Tarkov and loving, loving games and doing what I do. And then um, next year, we'll be living in Europe I'll, I'll be over there in January, but Willu will join about March. And we'll be traveling around Europe, meeting people, doing epic things, mm. partying up, traveling, <laughs> drinking random food, <laughs> any random food that we can get our hands oh, on. Everything. Meeting random people, doing anything. Like the, when the website's done, um, it's going to just be pestdoy.com. But when the website's done, yeah. um, it'll have application forms. That if anyone has out, out there has an idea of something cool they'd like to do with us, like, you've got a favorite restaurant or just anything you own a mm. own a company do it that does cool shit oh, i will do anything i'm keen to i'm do doing everything. a shoey in every country again so so far for those who don't know <laughs> every country i've ever visited which is maybe 17 countries including afghan i've done a shoey like a drink a beer out of my shoe or, or a substance out of a shoe at every one of them and it's not going to stop <laughs> yeah it's happening yeah so i'm going to blend all my food and drink it so um but yeah, so we're gonna. I'm gonna be in Europe next year. I'm gonna mm. still be streaming four days a week, and then I'll be doing vlogging and and yeah. um, making a documentary for every other mm. day that I'm not streaming games. Yeah, which we'll both be helping each other on. As yeah, well. and mm. so we'll be doing his stuff while he's over there. He's gonna do his podcast and stuff too, mm. and that will be all of next year. Now the year after that, so I'm just to, full disclosure. I'm 32 and a half, and so um, my wife is uh, shit. She's late 20s. Um, so when when we get back from Europe, we want to have kids. Like we're pretty open about that. Or you can adopt me. Or we can adopt Willie. <laughs> and um, so um, we need to settle down in the show for a little bit. But we we're probably going to come back and have kids, and that's going to make it quite difficult um, so, to do much traveling. But I still want to continue doing the content creation side of things. Yeah. I've found something I'm really passionate about and enjoy. And if if Europe goes well, right? If Europe, if I can travel Europe and stream. And enjoy life mm. i'll pretty much continue doing that everywhere in the world now obviously yeah. kids will slow that down a little bit but um if we can big tra- ass winnebago man yeah kids in the back big winnebago and I, I, we're not joking like we're i'm actually looking at winnebagos for europe mm. and um we just want to travel and enjoy life because honestly i don't really care if i have no money at the end of the day if i've if i'm 80 years old and i've got no houses and like, yeah, you know, yeah. everything I've got no money it doesn't bother me I want to die broke but with some fucking epic stories exactly <laughs> yeah like I know and so for me like on my bucket list I've got heaps yeah. I actually wrote a bucket list last year mm-hmm. which was um, like I wanted to jump out of plane and all that so when I was in New Zealand for my honeymoon I jumped out of plane hell yeah and I fucking loved it. How man. good is jump? I've got my um my B license to jump out solo out of plane yeah I fucking love that shit so I went <laughs> I went so sick I think it was 15,000 15, yeah that's that's as high as I take you. yeah and, yeah that's 5k yes. yeah and so I was 5k up and literally on my left was the top peak of uh, New Zealand which was Mount Cook and on the right was the beach like it, yeah. I was like in the most scenic area with glaciers and snow and it was like amazing man yeah and um, I just want to just live life like that man oh yeah same. and that's what I would do the reason why I stream as much as I do besides the fact I love it is I don't really have any drive to do stuff at the moment in Adelaide mm. is I'm getting everything ready for Europe because I've been planning this trip for about five years mm. and once Europe comes along it's going to be yeah no holding back yeah and that's sort of because I'm very army oriented with sort of everything I do um, and at least inspirational people uh, at least and have a lot of inspirational people so as I travel Europe with Paul I'm going to be trying to interview like veterans from each so say we go to Germany on intro uh, in, pff, interview sorry i can't talk interview like a, a german veteran who's been to like afghan or whatever or, or wherever um and to go with that as well as you know doing a lot of filming with with paul and um smashing out some real good stuff because i've got a massive passion in photography and videography so i'll be helping out, um paul a bit with <laughs> with all that sort of yeah. stuff as well so that'll be epic is sort of combining skills stories backgrounds um because me and paul are very sort of different people i guess um 
But I guess that's why we get along so well. So, but I think it's going to be an epic trip. We're we're, we're definitely with different people because, like, we've grown up differently in different ages and that. Yeah. But we still have the same drive to live life fully. Oh shit! And so I actually invited Willie to Europe before he even was diagnosed. Yeah. Um, it would have been about a year before because, Mm -hmm. like. From the short time I was in charge of him, it was only about six months. In charge of me. No, he's right. You're right. I was in charge of him. Yeah. <laughs> For the short time I was in charge of him, it, I had a blast. He made time fun. Like, if you actually go through my backstory um, video on YouTube, mm. you'll see photos of us. I, um, oh, really? Yeah, it's the Adelaide Phoenix game. <laughs> right? I haven't got the YouTube video of oh him dancing God. in the hallways. Oh, I haven't got God. that up. We have to tell the story of that after. Yeah, but oh, shit. he... Like him and I were there having a blast, and those oh, it was just a every time. Every time I have an experience with Willie, it's always been fun and enjoyable. Yeah, it's like, it doesn't always have to have alcohol involved either. We've always had a good laugh. Yeah, and that's how you know that you're hanging around the right kind of people for me, at least. People that hang around people that improve your life, and and that I fuck. It. When I got diagnosed, man, I cut away so many fucking people out of my life because it's like I've got five years left. Fuck you and fuck you and fuck you, like. You make my life miserable. You ask too much of me, and fuck you, just because like you're a dick. Um, <laughs> and I'm just because I, I wanted to say fuck you to one more person. I guarantee you, I am so much fucking happier now. Like I'm happier now than I was then because I've just been like, no, you you ask you ask of me, and you never give back. I had people when I got diagnosed be like, oh no, nah, um, like oh you're so selfish. All you've all you've wanted over the last few months is about you. I'm like, you fucking serious? You were going through boyfriend problems. And I've got fucking brain cancer. <laughs> Don't you say I'm a fucking selfish prick. And uh, Milner says I've got one story with Willie, and it's a great one. Yeah, that was epic. That was at your wedding. That was a that was a sick day. Um, oh, the, the Adelaide Phoenix game we were talking about before. The only way to describe it is lingerie football. It is lingerie. Football. It's lingerie football. Anyway, in the lunchroom, as in work, like American football, not Australian. Oh yeah, like NF- NFL. Yeah. Yeah. They had these posters up to go to this, and we're all like, "We are fucking going! Like, we have to go to this event!" And like, all so week, what, I, like, I don't do anything half-assed, right? Oh no! Nah. So no, I, neither. I got the whole company involved, mm. as in, like, we're talking a hundred blokes. I invited the whole company and said, "You have to dress up in red as yeah. much red as you can, because that was their color." Yeah. And I said, "I'll get body paint, and we'll write Phoenix on our stomachs." <laughs> And then oh, we'll do chants, oh. we'll do everything. We did not hold back. Oh, like, no. And we were the drunkest oh, people sh- in the crowd, but we had the whole stadium cheering. Oh, bro. But the funny thing was, <laughs> I just thought of this, we were like in the, one of the front rows, like one of the tiers, yeah. and we were just like yelling abuse at the other team. And the fucking parents of the other team <laughs> yeah. were all behind us like, you guys are assholes. Like, what do you mean? Like, oh, that's our daughter. We're like, oh, <laughs> sorry. Like, Hang on, that's your daughter? Like, why are you here? This is lingerie football. Like, oh, and then... I remember standing up on like standing on like the railing and just like Phoenix just like going. Yeah, we were doing all the chance. And honestly though the crowd loved it and the, the team loved it even oh, more. Yeah. And then I we met the I team was, after the game. I may have got shit faced, which is I've pretty much video of pretty much faced. every single story I've ever got is like, yeah, and I was shit faced. Um <laughs> and then this happened. But I ended up down in the crowd working on like old ladies it was fun I've got the video I'll, it was, I'll, I'll it was, put it up yeah, somewhere I, I actually haven't seen it since well I've yeah. only remembered my own eyes and I and then we <laughs> but it, we got into their change rooms that was like it was like they they went to the pub right next door no 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 no. but before that they had like the presentation we're in the rooms and there's a bit. photo it might be you and me or it's me and Gilly no, that, maybe. Was, that was the pub next door was it? Oh, yep. true. That shows up. It was how, pretty drunk. Yeah. And we are completely shirtless, just in like jocks, lying on the table yeah, in front that, of the that, team. That's in the pub. As they're signing shit, we're just lying there. And then it, someone arm wrestled one of the girls and broke her fucking arm. Yeah, I know. It was like this chick was like <laughs> a weapon. Like we're talking like, I don't know. She, she was like bigger than Phil Heath in mm. that photo. And yeah. she just like, arm wrestling this other chick oh, and her arm just snaps. And I'm just like, <gasps> it was the most disgusting thing. I was like, <laughs> you see her face and you're just like, Looking at everyone else, you're like, call an ambulance, someone, oh, please. Man. And we felt so guilty. We're like, we've come and we've ruined this event. Like, oh, it was just... That it was, was such... I'd forgotten it. That was such a good day, man. Yeah, man. Holy shit. Yeah. And it's I like, wish I wasn't so drunk so I could remember more of it. I've got plenty of photos. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> I've got plenty of photos. So good. I, I, I kept right. the, most, the, the most appropriate ones for the video on the YouTube. It's still... um. 
jugs. It's still his fucking profile picture. It's is it? me and him. It's like me and him, and you're in the background. And I had those like tassels. Like, <laughs> yeah, and like I've got tassels. tassels. I'm saying, they're like, Whoa! And it's like still his fucking profile photo. Like three years on, I'm like, ah, oh, bruh, like, can you stop with the tassels? The guy reckons um, Cliff says that's like a hangover movie. He hasn't heard about my um, European vacation, or yeah. accidentally ended up in Finland. Well, we'll keep that. We'll keep that we'll, for another. We'll keep time. that on. Oh, I accidentally ended up in Finland one day. <laughs> like he got drunk and went to Finland. All right. Mm. I promised, um, old mate, before. So the point we're trying to make, mm. I'm making at least, is I like living life to the fullest. My next five years will be filled with living life and doing stuff, and, and my wife, she's all about it too. So that's why she quit her job recently. She mm. wants to play in Europe with me and get more excited about that so we'll take a financial hit because now we're relying on the income i make from streaming content creation mm. purely to prepare ourselves for europe and so like by the way I, you guys have spoiled the shit out of me for the content creation side of things so yeah. don't feel like we're struggling we're oh, doing fine <laughs> but um like we're super excited for europe and all the money that is coming into the stream we're literally putting back into europe because mm. we are so excited for europe oh yeah now if you don't mind someone asked me a question before and i, I want to get to it Oh yeah. Um, so Woodsy said, uh, Pestley, what would you say would have made your time better in the infantry? Things like in the downtime, instead of sitting around and painting rocks, which was probably a realistic thing, yeah. uh, would it have made a dis- difference if you were allowed or encouraged to do more professional development or extracurricular staff to broaden your skills? Now there was actually a fair few driven people in the military. Um, two, one of my, two of my sergeants were probably, probably the best soldiers in the battalion in their primes Mm -hmm. and they became sergeants and the the fact was they were the kind of people that said hey if you've got a good idea let me know and we'll go with it and there are those people in the military and when you they're your bosses the time is so good like because they'll be like all right what's a cool idea and you'll be like oh can we go i don't know let's go to the beach and do pt yeah that'd be as a simple one but let's go to the beach and do platoon pt down at the beach and like the next friday you're he filled out the risk assessment form and you guys are going down to the beach and doing pt Mm. like that is not even unrealistic but he would go to the effort to fill out that risk assessment form and you'd go to the beach Mm. um and i got what's called a a commander's comment commendation or something because i um i made this whole scenario base uh exercise on base um, I didn't fill out all the correct forms, so I, I narrowly dodged a few bullets um, from from <laughs> higher. But it pretty much made it so the whole platoon rocked up for work, um, thinking they were doing PT, mm. and they got told we're actually on a mission right now, and they had to get ready to like go out into the scrub and do a full fucking mi- full mission profile. Mm. And so no one had ever done that before, but mm. I actually made it like no one knew besides the bosses. Wait, I got what year was that? 2013 oh okay no, i was fucking lit <laughs> right so and i did this as a private right um so i made this whole full mission profile people rocked up to work pretend thing they were doing pt they got told hang on get in your cams we're going straight out into the field right yeah. now um and so it was testing people's like readiness of how the gears set up they had to go do this stuff in the um in the scrub and they it went all the way to lunchtime and people were freaking out like oh i'm not gonna get my breakfast like shut the fuck up like i've put a lot of effort into this yeah, and, and so the complainers the complainers will complain about that shit and then at the end of it go oh shit that was actually pretty cool and then i got them an extended lunch break because they missed out on breakfast you know what i mean so like you got to treat the boys like that and and that's how i did it but um people that are willing to go to that effort are the ones that make the job more exp- uh, more oh, enjoyable they prove it. Yeah. Un- unfortunately it's those sergeants that get in in a lot of shit from higher because it's not ticking the boxes of the higher ranks the end of the day and, and this is going to be really brutal towards officers officers don't really give a fuck unless they're ticking boxes to get the next promotion so officers work on a totally different promotion scheme to privates and and, and corporals etc the way an officer works is they've got four years to become a captain which is usually pretty straightforward from captain to major they've got four years which is two reporting periods they have to tick certain boxes in those in those four years if they don't tick those boxes they get two more years and if they don't do that in that period then they get booted they pretty much get told you're either going to live in the middle of nowhere or get the fuck out right so that's a lot more cutthroat for them um and so when sergeants start saying or lieutenants start going oh we're gonna go do this mm. then the, the the captains and the majors are like but that's not ticking our box mm-hmm. that's literally what they think and so they start putting the foot down and say no so i know it's a very long-winded 
um, no, answer to your question. Good, no, that's a good answer. But though. that is seriously like if if we had the right people in charge that were pers- pursuing excellence all the time, whilst it might get really tiring because it's always pushing you, people in the end of the day would enjoy their job because they'd be more passionate about it instead of just. But that's my mate's point of the guys who this, the guys who would do that. You know how many guys are still uh, doing this at work? Tinder, just, just Tinder all day. That's, I don't do that. I would. I've never done that, and would <laughs> would never do that. I'm just gonna. I'm heard he's asking a question. He goes, "Why do you both rock a mustache?" I reckon every man should rock a mustache at least once in their at life. At least once in your life, because you get so attached. Are you attached to yours? No, not really. Really? Oh shit! I get so attached to mine. I play with it a lot. Oh, I play with mine. Mine's real small at the moment. My I normally rock a really big mug. He does. Like I rock a a, a decent mug. I was at a pub the other day. I was at um. Moose heads in Canberra, and this chick comes up and goes, "Your mustache is shit." And all the boys around me is like, "Oh, <laughs> like <laughs> he normally has the best one ever, but fuck you." And then she was like, "I'll tell a little bit of a story here." She, she, you know, just just because it was the best owning I've ever heard in my life. Um, she was like being a bit of a bitch to some of the boys, and one of the boys goes, "Oi, are you playing hard to get?" She's like, "Oh, I guess so." And he goes, well, you're fucking hard to want. <laughs> <laughs> and then so you heard her friends leave the pub and there's just high fives going like, yes, the boys. Um, but that was a good that was a good thing in Canberra. Um, but the moustache, it evolved from me not wanting to shave my whole face. Yeah, because the, the army military, you shave yeah. every day. It actually sort of happened to me in Afghan because, of course, seven days a week I was shaving. And I was just like, this is too much on my skin. I'm going to grow a massive fucking mo. And get your sideies down to the bottom of your ear. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you look, there's a, a couple of photos of my own Instagram where I'll send you if you're really that keen. Um, fuck, I had big sideburns and a moustache and like shaved sides of my head. Pretty much, oh, like, a, like a half on the sides. It was sick. So um, for me, I had a moustache for a heaps of times in my career. Oh, yeah. But I posted a couple of photos in that backstory video I posted on YouTube. Yeah. And then heaps of people in my uh, stream kept asking me to grow one. I said, I'll do one for a wipe. So in Escape from Tarkov, there's different wipes yeah. uh, between patches. So from patch 11.7 to patch 12.0, mm-hmm. I'm growing a mustache. And that's my wife said, that's fine. God, I hope they postpone that patch. Well, it's gonna, it, at the moment, it's probably going to be a good three to four months. So well, To go? Yeah. Oh, so, yes, that's brilliant. Um, um, if anyone from here is like a creator of Tarkov, hold off on the patch. <laughs> like <laughs> hold off for like twelve. So what, the, the rule was she gets to trim it if it gets like oh that's fair across yeah. the mouth. Oh, you stuff. need you need to trim trim. trim I don't really care to be honest. I'm just like fucking. But you look good with like mustaches. Look great. Every guy in their life needs to rock a mo at some point. Yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant thing. So if anyone actually has any uh, military focused questions, yeah, we'll jump into the Q and A part of this. Yeah, go for it because yeah. we've got probably somewhere between half an hour and an hour and a half left. So yeah, um, but yeah, so. So the, the oh sorry the the first part of this was more of a podcast sort of who are we um like it's just a good opportunity for you to talk about your service because you I, as you said you don't really talk about it that much because no. you don't let it define you I guess on yours and I sort of do um so this was more of a, a formal podcast I've talked more now about the military than I probably have since I've been in the military yeah what's well, a good thing um and then we'll jump into like a um actual part of this um the Q and A part of this so yeah so if anyone's actually talk. interested in joining. Mm-hmm. Um, a military it doesn't have to be the Australian and you have any questions feel free to chuck them out there yeah. um, I've had a, oh, you and me have had no a bit of with foreign militaries too uh, mostly Southeast Asia but I've had a bit to do with the US Marines as yeah. well I was on an exercise for a month um, with them but there's also uh, other servicemen and ex-servicemen in chat also um, if you want to know s- certain things about what we f- our favourite parts what guns we like, to shoot, like shooting oh, um, all anything. that kind of stuff yeah I I before, while, whilst we're loading up some questions, um, I actually had an incident back in 2011 where I was yeah, shooting a yeah. 50 cal. And um, I was so the, the way a, a big 50 cal machine gun on a tripod mount. And um, so we did this massive attack. And imagine the attack coming straight for, to this way. This is all live fire. And then we had what's called support by fire up on a hill. And then the support by fire had like three 50 cals, a couple of 84 millimeter cargo stuff, rocket launchers, some 40 mils, and they were shooting off to the side a little bit. So the people who were attacking mm. got to hear all this massive gunfire as they're doing their attack. And um, I was shooting the, the 50 cal, and uh, we had what's called a hard cock, which is where the gun doesn't actually. F- <laughs> is it now? <laughs> yeah. So the gun doesn't fully um, bring the cocking hand, or it, it, the cocking handle won't go fully back. They had a jam, and then the cocking hand goes halfway back. It's called a hard cock. 
And so the um, my boss at the time, my seco, he he comes over and he's like, he goes, all right, hold on to it, and he starts kicking the gun. Like he kicks the cocking handle as hard mm-hmm. as he could because that's the only way to get it out, yeah. to get the jam out. Because there's a 50 cal cartridge stuck in the the barrel yeah. and it's jammed in there, and you got to literally use all your force to get it out. And so he kicks it, and in the process of kicking it, he dislodges the barrel from the locking right position. <laughs> Right, which I didn't know. This is my theory, at least, because there's no proof of evidence of where, what happened. So after it dislodges and it chambers the next round, I, I cock it again, chambers the next round, everything's rigid, did, ready to fire. My uh, CSM, country sar- company sergeant major, standing right behind me. Um, I go, yep, are we good to go? And he's like, yep, no worries. No, all right, cool, scene on firing now. And as I click the shoot button, it blows up the whole gun. Like mm-hmm. it's, barrel goes about five meters to the front, um, big puff of smoke everywhere, and um, the, when you when you're firing a 50 cal on a tripod on on the ground, you actually have your feet up on the side of the um the the 50 cal. Yeah. Fucking, I thought to turn audio off a bit. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But turn the um the the audio off for for bits if you can. Oh, I don't know how to do that. The desktop audio down the bottom. Oh my god, this one here. Wait. Oh, we'll just go. We'll just go with it. On the actual. Yes. Anyway, so we'll, we'll just go with it. <laughs> with with the actual blowing up, um, we'll just don't don't donate bits, guys. So with the blowing up of the uh, the fifty cal, um, actually the cartridge of the fifty cal round goes out the bottom, goes right into my groin, mm-hmm. misses misses my femoral artery, my nerves, um, the crown jewels, and everything goes yeah. about. I can't show you, but imagine this is my leg. I've seen it. <laughs> imagine this is my leg goes in about here and ends up right right in my groin, mm. and um. And luckily, nothing major happened to me. But I've actually still got it at home. Uh, the actual piece of piece of uh, copper that's in my yeah. to win in my leg. Mental brass, sorry, brass, not copper. Oh, either, either, either. Yeah, absolutely mental. Of course, Willie's seen it. <laughs> yeah, I saw. It. I was playing Monopoly at your house one day when I came over to help you move all your fucking bricks. Yeah, remember your old place? Yeah. yeah. Fuck, that was a pain in the ass. Moved about twenty tons of shit. Yeah, I moved about. <laughs> you know the best thing about being, you moved a, out of the fucking being house. a section commander is you get you get your, your diggers to come around and help lift rocks. Like, hey, Willie, do you want to come over for a beer? Like, yeah, man, I'm here. Rock up. It's like, I'll wear work clothes. Like, yeah, right. By the way, we're carrying 12 ton of concrete. I've just crushed it in the backyard with yeah. a jackhammer. It's like, yeah, I've just been jackhammer in the backyard. Might have given me a hand. Like, and it's like a 45 degree day. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, so I might read a question if you want to take over then I'll have my say yeah. um, so I'm the guy with the U session coming up and I'm a bit worried about the fact that I have slight asthma have you guys had any mates not get in because of asthma I know it is a hard one I know, I know there's plenty of people in the military with asthma yeah they might make you do testing um, you know that test where you're like blowing a, a thing and it's got like a little strip that goes and to, depend, to tells you how much air is in your lungs or whatever <laughs> You're probably going to have to do a few tests like that, and they're going to work out what exactly is. If it's um, slight, you'll get in. Yeah. Honestly, dude, there, there, there is being honest, and there's telling them what they need to know. So yeah. what I would say is... If they don't ask, if, don't tell. If, honestly, if your asthma doesn't give you problems and you don't think it's going to be an issue, like, be honest with yourself. If you don't think it's going to be an issue, hmm. just say, oh, sometimes it plays up, but it's very rare. Yeah. That's all you need to say, because you're yeah. not lying. Yeah, you, you've you've only or you haven't had it play up in months or years or whatever to say that, mm. but don't go like oh when it does play up though it's fucking horrible and I'm like oh. yeah, don't say that don't if like, I'm don't dying. cause like I know people that like okay so my cousin didn't get into the military because his elbow dislocated when he was like a year old yeah right and they were like all right get a test done for a specialist but by the way you're not going to get in unless we deem so and they he did all these specialist tests they said they can't even tell that it was dislocated when he was one year old. Mm didn't matter he's, he, he was lazy and he had his mum fill out the form and said his mum said it was being dislocated yeah like you don't need it if don't. you don't need to tell him something like don't. don't like i'm not saying lie i'm just saying there's a line and you need to be careful how much you yeah. say because they will very quickly look at anything like i said what we said before mm. if if they're liable for all your medical so as soon as like they if, if they know you have asthma and you have an asthma issue they're going to cover you, but if it's the reason why you get discharged, you won't get a payment for the actual, yeah. the because you got discharged because of your asthma. But your medical's covered, so you don't have to worry about that side of things. But you want to be able to get in at least. Yeah, yeah. Want just get in. Um, Woodsy asks myself, um, 
yeah, I know you've been tied to the infantry, but have you looked at other options within the military? Not really. Um, I'm, would you know it's hard, but I sort of live and breathe infantry. Like, it's what I'm interested in. It's what I, what I do, and where my heart and soul lies. And I sort of, um, I sort of think about it as if I wasn't, if I wasn't a grunt, then I probably wouldn't be in the army. Uh, that's not that's not dissing any other cause. Um, it's just that's where my heart lies. I don't think I'd put in. I don't think I'd put in the amount of effort I do at my job if uh, in another role. I think it'd always be a discredit to the army, and I'd I'd probably leave before changing course. To be honest, myself, I just couldn't see myself somewhere else. I couldn't see myself inside the army. <laughs> I'd yeah. easily go to air force. In all seriousness, mm. if you're thinking about joining the Australian Army, Air Force or Navy, uh, unless there's a job in the Army that you're really passionate that you want to mm. do, definitely look at Air Force and Navy. Oh, have a, yeah, check it out. Like if, if there's a, and the big thing is, if the job is mirrored in the Air Force and Navy, do so the Air medics, Force and Navy side. Medic, yep. you all go to the same school and then at the end you get divvied up Army, Navy, Air Force. Fucking go Air Force or yes. Navy. Um I, I, okay, let me just put it in this perspective. It, Navy has the highest budget because, okay, Australia's an, an island and we're surrounded by water. And so they need to put more money into the Navy because that's yeah. our major defense. There's $100 billion going to the port here. Exactly. So, like, the Navy gets a lot more funding. Therefore, they get more equipment, more positions, more everything. So, and the newer equipment and everything. Well, the Army's playing catch up at the moment because been, they've been updating a yeah. lot of their stuff. But if you can get the same job in, or even just a job that you'd like to do in the Air Force or Navy, you get treated a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more opportunities. The postings are better. Like everything is better in the Air Force yeah. or Navy. And I know it says always the grass is greener on the other side, but I know guys have switched over from infantry to AGs, which is Air Defense Guard, which is you it's look at their job, world. you look at their job title and their description, and it's literally a copy paste from infantry pretty much. Mm. Right, except for they only do the infantry job within five kilometers of an airbase. Oh, it's less than that now. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so, but the he he went across to Adjis and he's like oh, laughing at us now. Yeah. So the guys <laughs> at infantry, he's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, man. Um, so some people ask, um, <laughs> Willie, what are you gonna do when you beat cancer and your liver's fucked from all the booze? Don't worry about my liver; it's all good. Liver's regrow. Yeah, liver's regrow, man. So I'll grow one in a test tube and give it to me. Oh, that's what I'm hoping. I don't actually drink that much. I think it's just. Oh, mate, maybe I don't drink that much. I'm definitely not an alcoholic. Although we did do this al alcoholic test one day. It's like if you got over seven, you're an alcoholic, and I'm sitting there like, oh shit. But I don't think anyone got under that, so it's just one of those things. Um, so Basta asks, um, do you have a plan or something you want to pursue? To myself, um, I wouldn't say a plan. Like I really want to pursue more media stuff. Like I can't say which one, but I'm part of a TV show coming up pretty soon um as well as all my instagram social media and and things like this are becoming a lot more apparent um so that's more what i'm looking to do um is a more immediate side but then i still have um i guess some of my media stuff is restricted by my service as far as like um at least earning money through it or um pursuing some sort of things i think about it um but if i were to get separated that's 100 percent the the path I'd look down but I, I just want to I want to build my Instagram to a point where it's like holy fuck this dude's got this illness it's fucking sick um, but that, that's what I want to do um, I think one of the hardest so, things yeah. for Willie and, and I can speak about it because it's not me but Willie's done an amazing job in raising money for charities with um, what was the charity you were raising money for? Uh, so I raised for, actually for two I raised for the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation which yep. is a research for brain cancer yep. um, and then the Charlie Teo Foundation which is a well, it's, it's, he's, a, he's a neurosurgeon, a very incredibly famous neurosurgeon. Yep. It's into um, his research. And it's actually, it's interesting with him because a lot of his money goes into research. The other, that's like 80%, and the other 20% actually goes into his own school of excellence. So he's like, he runs like, Trans imagine like a school of infantry surgeons. and then like your special operations schools. He runs like a special operations sort of thing for brain surgeon. Neuro neurosurgeon. So he yeah. goes in, apparently I sort of fucking hate him. But with university, he goes in and be like, "I'll oh, see you getting A's in neurosurgery. I'll pay for all your shit if you come to my school and I teach you how to operate on these." Yeah. And he's funding things like the he's funding the first cannabis cannabis trials in the world on brain tumors and all this other shit. Um, so I've raised it's just over sixty thousand dollars, think directly into research. Yeah. Because that's where like. So, so oh, the, yeah. the point I'm trying to make is mm. Willie's done an amazing job for raising money for charity in mm. um, cancer research and that. 
and um, we all know, like from this podcast, that, that Willie might not have a lot of time left in the military, and he is very passionate about um, living life to the fullest and all that kind of like, and and you know, just getting involved in media and and, oh, yeah. and helping people out as well. So it's difficult because he doesn't want to be identified as the person who has brain cancer no. and then trying to make money off it. You know, that's that's probably the most difficult thing because yeah. um, he is an awesome bloke and he does these awesome, awesome things and then people just label him as that guy who's got brain cancer. Mm. And so then the problem with that is then as soon as he, like, say, starts a Twitch channel, you know, people will come in like, oh, but now you're trying to make money because you've got cancer. No, the pe- he's not going for the pity vote. He no. doesn't give a fuck about the pity vote. And honestly, he just wants to live life and, 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 yeah. and live it up. Hmm. So um, it's really difficult but for, for Willie. And um, hopefully with with uh, the next few years, he'll have an opportunity to um, really show how you can live life hmm. with an illness. Yeah, oh, that's, that's what I'm hoping to do. I think this opportunity with you next, next year is, is helping me a lot with that because um, we will have definitely different experiences in Europe and I've heard about my Europe trips before they can get pretty loose um, but I get pretty dead serious on things too like I can be I can be the loosest dude ever as far as drinking and partying and travelling but when I'm serious I'm serious um, and I had a heap of dudes have a go at me about I release a, a few YouTube videos being like um, how I view death because I, I'm non I'm not spiritual at all. And that's not against anyone's religion or, or view. It's just myself. Um, and I released a video talking about how I deal with the, the thought of death. And I got all this hate about like, oh, you're just trying to capitalize on your illness, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, are you fucking serious? I'm like, have you been on Instagram and seen the amount of girls or amount of people who get surgeries done, like enhancements to then earn money off Inst- on Instagram, YouTube, whatever? I haven't earned a cent. I've got a brain tumor, and you're coming at me like fuck off. Um, yeah. And I just block them. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Yeah, I don't it's, give a shit if I lose. It's one of those shit, of shit things that happen. Uh, and people get that tall poppy syndrome. Man. I, yeah. I had friends be like, "Oh, you're too good for us now because you got ten thousand followers." But what? <laughs> like, fuck off. All right, I'll ask you this one. So Sergov was um he's reapplying uh, to get in the military, and he goes, "He did report their recruit skill." Sorry, he did recruit school in 2004 and left because he was an idiot. Uh, <laughs> reapplying for, at, to the Air Force at the moment. Completed the USASH and have submitted a reference and a letter of intent. So he he's, wants to reapply. What would be your advice, Willie, for someone who's trying to reapply? Um, or do you know how things work yeah, with that? You need to re-identify. I don't really know how it works. I've never reapplied myself. But you need to... Uh, and I'm not sure of the army's admin stance on that, but my stance would be you really need to assess what went wrong in the first place. You say you're an idiot. Now, does that mean you weren't fit enough, you weren't healthy enough, you weren't emotionally ready, mentally ready? Maturity. Mat- maturity. Like, you need to... And, th- and uh, accepting yeah. the fact that saying you weren't mature at the time yeah. and you had now gotten to yourself. And, and that will go a long way with recruiters. If you just say to a recruiter, I uh, say you ended when you were 18... Like, sir, I was not mature enough to go on 18. And I'm actually glad I pulled the pin because I would have not done as good of a job as I could have done now. I needed this life experience that I've gained to go through with it. Be real with yourself, but you also need to identify why you did that for your own, for your, for yourself. Um, if it's a fitness thing, if it's an emotional thing, maturity thing, identify that within yourself and and be honest with them about, well, like, look, I did pull it because I knew at the time I wasn't mature enough. Um, and that, that's why I did it. But I'm back. I've, I've, but make sure you tell them what you feel was wrong. Say I was mature enough. Rec- say how you've rectified that. So you got well. I've gone off and I've done a year of university or, or a year of traveling to sort of find myself more, find my ground, what's important to me. And now I'm reapplying because now I feel I am truly ready to do this job. I think that's probably the best advice. Yeah, and be honest and be honest with yourself. Mainly be honest with yourself. I'd say if you don't think you're going to enjoy it as well, like I know that's easy to say, but. Hmm. If, if you're doing it because like, you just want a job, that's probably not going to be... It's like, not going to work. There's so many people that are joining the military like, oh, I'm just going to... Because mm. I don't have anything better to do. And they get there and they freaking hate it. Yeah. They really do oh, If you're not passionate, it. it'd be fucking like hell on earth, I tell you. Um, so, Herdy, thank you so much, man, um, for saying I did such a good job with the um, fundraising, man. I really, uh, really do appreciate it, brother. And um, it means a lot to anyone who... Well, pretty much anywhere you live. If you live in Australia um, and some other European and plus American countries, there will be another tight flip this year to raise money um, 
100% for brain cancer research. 100%. I actually end up out of... I'm not, I'm not trying to play a sympathy card here, but um, because my whole thing is I donate 100% of your money, I it can actually end up out of pocket for some of these. I don't care because it's something I'm so passionate about. But a lot, a lot of people sort of start about like, oh, oh man, you're just benefiting off this. Like how much is going to charity? I'm like, well, 100% because I pay for the permits. I pay for my travel. I pay for all this. So I can guarantee you all your money goes directly where you think it's going. Unlike most charities, which are fucking bullshit. <laughs> like, oh no, there are a heap of veterans charities, whatever, who um, it's like 95% of the money goes directly to wages and salaries and shit I'm like fuck that I hate that stuff um there was a, a question here I'm just trying to find where it was from IIMH is that what you're no, looking no, for no. Oh. Mm. Well, someone about what's the best advice for, uh, for reapplying after getting med for the first round well, um it really comes down one. to the to the med for um if it's something I'm, I'm trying to figure out an ex I, Okay, say you were med four because you didn't have an arm, but somehow you got the arm back. Like yeah. that, you're going to get through that way. But if if it's something that you haven't totally healed, or if, say it was um, something that was a say a, a mental illness or something like you yeah. were going through a tough time, and that's why they deemed you med four, then that would be the um, and you've somehow can prove it. But the military, the the hardest gate of getting into military is the med system. I would say. Yeah, once you pass that, you're pretty good. Um, yeah. if, if they once once they put you on a definite no it's it's, it's fucking tough um, I don't know anyone I but get a referral from um from your your GP so um oh god imagine it's uh, like like Paul said um, I almost called you best silly then uh, like like you Paul said nah, I'll call you Paul <laughs> uh, you'll feel too much of a super side then um say it's a mental health issue um, and that was we say a few years ago, make sure you get a clinical psychologist or a GP or someone to write a referral that, and this goes not only with mental health but with physical health that they think you're fit enough. That will actually travel a lot with the doctor. And you have that before you even get there. Oh shit, yeah. Because they're going to ask for it anyway. One hundred percent. They're not even going to go. They're not going to take. They don't get, care about your word. Well, you're not a doctor. It's your. Yeah. It's your, your liability. They need the proof. Like, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, it's it's just the way the the military does their stuff, particularly on the med side of things. Um. So while in Europe, are you going to do stuff for fundraising? Fuck yeah. So for me, <laughs> now, when I was in Indonesia, studying Indonesian, um, I actually taught my teachers Indonesian. Uh, sorry, I, I, did, I gave lessons to my teachers and I was talking about th the lesson I gave to my teachers while speaking Indonesian was, I'm going to Europe for a year. And whilst I'm in Europe, I can only... S I can only bring awareness to one charity or mm -hmm. one thing, and what would you do? And everyone, like I, they, we brainstormed a few, and then they'd pick one. So I said, "What are you passionate about?" And you know, like it'd be like homelessness or, mm -hmm. you know, um, all these different ones. And so for Europe, for me, there's there's two things I'm pretty passionate about, um, and one, I'm, I'm well, okay, there's I'm really passionate about climbing mountains, but there's two types of or groups of people that I'm pretty passionate about helping if I can. Um, one is homeless people. When I was in in London in particular, it was really alarming to me how many homeless people were in London uh, for such a wealthy country and city with all these magnificent buildings and there was all these homeless people everywhere. So homeless, bringing awareness to, to the amount of homeless people around the world, probably one thing. And uh, the other one would be Sherpas. So yeah. people that um, climb mountains in countries. Um, a Sherpa is an actual people from Nepal that help people up get up get up Everest, but it's people are now referred to as Sherpas on other in other countries helping yeah. people get up mountains and stuff, and they get paid very little. Uh, they pretty much get paid whatever the wage is for their country, and these companies make a lot of money. So um, I'm not sure where and how I'm going to take it yet, but there will be some sort of some sort of awareness at least. I don't know. If, I'm really I'm I won't say I'm skeptical about raising money. Um, but like for example I just raised money for Starlight Foundation and that's a very well known charity in Australia I did my research a uh, large portion of the money goes to actually helping kids out and, and that kind of thing and if I was to actually raise money it would have to be um, a very well thought out process for me um, but it's a hard one it is yeah. and um, when it comes to awareness I think even me just making videos talking about the issues in the countries I visit and 
and then trying to help people or just bring awareness in some way that would probably be the the path i would go down awareness but really, is so important people actually underestimate the importance of awareness you can't put it's because we we, are in, we live in a world where we put a dollar value on thing and that's how important something is awareness is so so important because it gets people with really big dollars on it um so say we can we can talk about brain cancer but if we make a big fucking noise about it next to the government puts in a hundred million dollars um and i think awareness is something that is so important and i think maybe that's maybe more so than the dollars i've ever raised the awareness i can i bring is probably the most proud thing of me yep. like i on my um, instagram like analytics whatever it's called i have a reach of about three hundred thousand people a week and i think in a way that's probably the best way of getting it out there about this disease um but more so to answer your question i will be definitely doing i'm not sure what in what yet but i will definitely be doing um some stuff in europe for uh for, for brain cancer and brain cancer and mental health are my big ones um and i think the mental health is more of a um more of an awareness thing uh, and advice thing than a monetary thing like brain cancer research um but i will definitely be doing if we find a fucking tractor tire we'll be flipping it yeah. um or or whatever um so i'm doing an ultra marathon just before i go over to europe for charity uh for veterans and brain cancer um it's a 100k run and then a thousand tire flips i'm not doing that by the way it's going to be a long it's a 35 hour cutoff so it's a 100k solid run then a thousand individual flips for a hundred kilo tire. Five k an hour is twenty hours. Is it over hills? It's going to be yeah, it's a trail run. Yeah. So that. it's going to be fucking tough, and I'm training for that now. <laughs> that was my sort of bucket list thing. If I finish chemo, and I'm like, yeah, twelve months from now, I'm doing an ultra marathon on this. Um, so that'll be raised, and so I'll be fit. I should, if I'm not, I'm fucked. But I'll be fit as fuck by the time <laughs> I get to Europe. Um, so I definitely will be doing some running while I'm there too. So sort of some wings for life stuff. If anyone wants to come for a fucking run in whatever country, I'm keen to do that too. Because you, you get to see like sort of um, different places running that you're driving through. So if, I, if you live in a European country and you want to go for a fucking a yog with me, it's yogging. It's a silent G. Um, I'm more than happy to um, to come out with you and um, cruise around, show me whatever. Um, and then I'll be blogging, uh, sorry, blogging, vlogging while I'm there of all that, all that stuff. So yeah, there, there definitely will be. I haven't got anything specifically on the cards, but 100%. Um, Hugo Blake asks, can a seven foot bloke join army crew? Don't. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, okay, let me put it this way. Yes, but Yes, not. but the first job you're going to get on a, in a tank, in, in an abram, mm. is a driver, and yeah. and then you're going to be a crew in that. So it's, it's, oh. it's not comfortable. Yeah, um, you got to remember the armor those have. Like, if you yeah. want to, though, if that's something you're passionate about, go for well, it, there's no, There's no reason you can't do it. The, only, the good thing about that, man, if you're seven foot and you join Abram's crew, you'll have so much drive to promote to be the crew commander. You'll be like, I need to get out of this fucking driver's seat, so I'm going to work super hard and then promote through to your crew. You're going to stand out the top. But don't let it stop you, man. Absolutely go for it, if, if that's what you want to do. Oh, he's a huge bloke. It's actually... Oh, Hugo bloke. It's actually a huge bloke. Oh, a huge bloke, is it? Sorry, yeah. man. Um, why would they not let a tall person in a tank? Uh, no, they'll 100% let a tall person in a tank. But you need to remember, those those tanks are an armoured beast. Like, it's not like a car where you open the door and it's spacious. There is little room you for people. You can't take photos in there, but I've seen inside them a yeah, fair few so, times. Yeah. And it's just... There's, it's there's small, a, man. It's a, a, a space designed to do a purpose, not... Yeah. a space for luxury you um it is it is a space to drive a tank and that's that it is little uh, and i'm a tiny dude and i know even in the um in the armored personnel carriers like i'm like five foot fuck all like i'm tiny and i struggle to get in the in the in the seat and i'm, I'm a little dude um i'm not mean to turn you away from it if that's what you really really want to do go for it but um don't be uh, abrams a think if they the more room they give you inside means the less armor they can have so they're like fuck it we'll give you the minimal amount of room so you've got the maximum amount of armor and maximum amount of armament being we'll, if we give you another square foot of room that's two round two rock oh two rockets two rounds we can fit in the back yeah so they will they will put two extra bombs on board it's and give you a foot less it's a it's a space to meet a purpose not for comfort yeah fucking home all right so Hurdy asked i'll ask willie this but pestoid did you ever struggle with fitness in the first six months enlisted and before enlistment kapuka and singo if so how did you overcome this so for me um the second time i joined i was i was honestly super fit like i was bodybuilding i was ready to ready to rock and roll the first time i joined when i was a reservist i was paranoid about the sit-ups there was feet hold and yeah so 
I could run at eight minutes something, uh, two point four when I was uh when I was nineteen. I was only fifty five kilo. Yes. I was fit. Uh, but I was running fit, not mm. like push-up mm. fit. So I could do the push-ups yeah, fine. Whip it. The running was fine, but the sit-ups I was paranoid about because my core strength was shit. Um, the thing is, if you can get through the gate at uh, before you get to Kapuka and then the first one at Kapuka, you're pretty much sweet for the rest of your career. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you would want to be comfortable at those first gates. I don't know, it's like 45 sit-ups when you first sign up. Oh, shit. Don't, oh, it's I something like 45 it's, it's, to get it's, in. It's, it's you're hell. honestly like oh, feet hell. There is a there is a beep test on like day two. Yeah, but that's seven point five, man. If you can't oh, do the beep test, lots of people fail it. I know. Okay, so if you need you, you want to be running like an eight point five on a on a beep test, and you with four, it's forty five sit ups. You want to be doing like seventy sit ups, feet held before you get in. If you don't think yeah. you're there yet, train. And like, it's, honest, honestly, if you're young, it is a fucking easy test to train for. Yeah, it, it is. You're not going to get more time you, than before you join because once you join, you don't have time. Nah, nah. I remember, I remember it was strictly Kabuka doing so many burpees and sit ups and push ups in my room, trying to get, trying to get. Fit. I never struggled with fitness. Um, in defence, I don't think like shit's hard. It doesn't mean things aren't physically hard, but I never struggled. Um, I mean, like, I struggled, but I wasn't never going to fail. Um, if you give yourself like honestly, give yourself like three months before going. In I, I believe unless you are like on my six hundred pound life on bloody netflix um you should definitely be able to in three months get the push-ups sit-ups and run like it, it's not god they're not looking for olympians they're looking for you to run an under 11 minute 30 b of like 2.4 k run that's that's easy it's just under 12 uh, under six minute k it's like shit i'd almost do that now <laughs> um and i'm all sorts of fucked out you know you'd be right you're right just just bloody um just train train before and if you're looking for programs there's shit loads of free ones online or hit me up and I'll point you in a direction of I have a lot of mates who run pre-enlistment stuff um, both sort of mentally preparing yourself and physically um, but not to take business away from them but there's also a lot of shit online for free um, it's, it's just it's one of those things alright crack ass pestoy do you how hard do you think it will be to become a clearance diver in the navy if you want my honest answer to that dude and I'm going to give you my honest answer mm. Pretty much any special forces entry um, category in the defense, either clearance diver, command, <laughs> like two forces. commando, or <laughs> SASR, um, you want to be in defense before you go for it. Um, I know that there is direct entry routes, but the the way it kind of works, so for the people that go direct entry to commando, mm. very small percentage of them oh, actually get through. I don't know. I think it's one or two. It's usually very it's few. Really. And some of these people like... But then you find out a lot of them were like, oh, it's ex-infantry, and I got out and got back into it. Yeah, and it's like, oh, no shit. And so most of the guys that do get in direct entry are from um, special operations in some respects, either like... Star Force. Um, Star Force. Soggies, yeah. Soggies, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so they're either in the know with the people, and, yeah. and sometimes it is who you know as well. Hmm. Um, but if you want to be a fish, honestly, I, the, I know yeah, one guy yeah. that's got in clearance divers from, who went, went, went from seven... It was very early in my career, so my memory's not the greatest about him. But he was a fish. He he definitely yeah. um, really good in the water. It, it, it's it's the special forces of the navy for the Australian Defence Force. Yeah, uh, it, I know it's, people a lot of people don't call it. A lot of people, a lot of people, and I'll I'll sort of disagree here. My opinion on it is clearance divers can actually then elect to go through two commando reinforcement cycle. My opinion is you're not special forces until you've gone through that cycle. Yeah. So, so you can be. So there are clearance divers. Say there's a hundred of them. Fifty have gone through it. Fifty haven't. The ones who have are SF. The ones who haven't aren't. Either way, it is fucking hard. There is a book called um, Clearance Diver to Mercenary, written by an ex-Australian clearance diver. Read that. That is. It's only. It's only say four or five years old. It is a fucking good insight into the unit. So look up that. Um, Clearance Diver to Mercenary is a good book to read about it. And, and just but it's hard, continue man. on from even though the fact that you just said you're extremely fit and a, natu- a national swimmer, as, as well as being awesome at swimming, you have to be mentally mentally prepared. And, yeah. and that's not just being smart. I'll, I'll talk about the smart side in a second. Mentally prepared is putting yourself in shit situations and being able to push through. Uh, I talked about earlier about how I was in Kapuka. I really didn't want to be there. And my corporal said, harden the fuck up pretty much. And if you quit now, you're going to quit everything in your life. Mm getting in that mental state where like okay I'm, i was really bad at swimming i used to be really bad and i'm actually quite confident now 
I used to go into a pool when I was bad at swimming and have a mate there with me and I said, I'm going to hold my breath for as long as I can, find out where I'm just about to pass out and I'll come back up. I'll wait five minutes and then I'll do it again. And, I, and I, I'm really big on pushing limits and I get you getting yourself into a mental state where you can feel comfortable in shit situations, mm. navigating underwater, right? So it's no longer navigating like we do on land where it's just walk that way and and that way it's now up and down as well it's a three-dimensional environment instantly yeah yeah and um so that thinking getting mentally prepared is quite difficult i i don't know a lot of things but um on how to do it without i probably have some references i could find you but the the main point i'm trying to make is find out ways to help prepare yourself mentally Mm. Uh, there's there's different um books on reading you can do sharpening the warrior's edge i can't remember i think it's william someone um there's a really good book on talking about getting yourself mentally ready for special forces warrior brothers by keith fennell it's good too because he was a warder in the sasr and he talks about his diving time too and the other side of things is puzzle solving Mm. right so Mm. and this is getting yourself mentally not mentally as in like um for mental toughness but intelligent wise uh, you know those aptitude tests you can get, like where you like got to match patterns and all that kind of stuff. Getting your brain thinking differently in different scenarios in different mm. ways, doing that stuff. So, if you're really serious about going for some sort of SF kind of way, mm. go get yourself uh, into um, go get go get go for a run, get absolutely exhausted, and then straight after it, start start write yourself write an exam, write an yeah. essay. Um, get your brain mentally prepared to put yourself in weird situations very quickly after each other. And, and I would say too for yourself, is it. K K rack oh, I'm just gonna go with that. Um, I'm not trying to diss on you here at all, man. Um, it's just my sort of from what I know. Yes, you may be a national level swimmer, but that's in a pool with goggles and and a speedo. Wait till they drop. If they drop you with no goggles in cams in the middle of the ocean at night, it, it, it that doesn't matter what your swimming credentials are. That all goes out the window. It's who you are mentally. And I'm not, you might, be, I'm, I'm just judging, you might be the best mental ever, but you got to think of that too. Of how, am I, how am I going to go drop and in And uniform? we're saying this in the way that we're trying to prepare you not to be a dick to you. Oh, mate, well. we, want you to, we want you to do this and succeed. Trust me, we, we want you to do this and smash it as easy as you can. We just don't want you to get too shocked when you're there because you might, you might um, Michael Phelps could go and fail. They could drop me in a drop him in the middle of the ocean where there's it's pitch black no, and sharks honestly, and if, shit. If, and if Michael fuck. Phelps was there, they would literally be like, "All right, we know this guy's a good swimmer. Yeah, let's, let's fuck on him. Let's fuck on him." That they would honestly be like that, and they would try and find ways to put him in uncomfortable situations <laughs> because they know he's a good swimmer. It, that he, they don't yeah. need proof that he can swim. Yeah so well they just need proof that he can handle the shit situations and they can't prove that while he's and, and that's a tiny part of the job man you got to remember swimming although yeah they call them clearance dives that's a tiny tiny part of the job you say before you've got your diver's license yeah, like an, an open water license is nothing like they're going to be doing like they do your um commercial sort of tickets like your um cccd or whatever they call themselves um like they do them in portland in victoria but anyway um we're not trying to shit on you at all, man. We're just trying to give you some sort of real stuff. They're doing diving explosions, diving welding, diving angle grinding. It's a very hard environment. And the, the clearance divers in Afghan, there are clearance divers in Afghanistan and Iraq all the time. They're not there diving. They're there blowing up bombs. They are they are EOD. They're explosive ordnance disposal. And so the, the way to, like, to really think about that is, um, are you comfortable welding? Not the swimming side of things. Are you comfortable welding? Yeah. Do you deep, think you'd be comfortable deep, deep. handling explosives and and yeah, on land and in, the, and in the water? Yep. Um, so we're not trying to. We, we honestly, mate, honestly want to see you succeed so much. It's just like a real world view, but like you've There's, got that drive, fucking good on you. And the you are so. Although we might have been like, oh, you, you blah 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 about swimming, you are fucking uh, worlds above me. Like I if I swimming. went there, I'd need to learn how to swim to be a fucking national swimmer. So that bit's good. Um, that's so one, one tick of many boxes. That's one tick of a lot. Yeah, that's what we're trying to say. Is you've got a big tick in one of many boxes. But if that's your passion, man, there's no reason you can't do it. So be good on you for having that that sort of passion to do it, man. That's um, no, you've you've done well. For but sure. But it also shows not being a national swimmer knows that shows that you got hard work, um, drive, and dedication. Oh, get, yeah. I'm sure you got up early every day. The swimmers so, get up at three in the morning. So yeah. that's that's really good, and uh, you probably already shaved your legs, which which is great because you know yeah. you could join recon. You can join recon. <laughs> so, um, but that's the point we're trying to make. It, it's and and that's like people like I'm going to go special forces, and they're like really fucking fit guys, and then you, you go all right. So yeah. explain to me the five. Oh, I don't know. You you explain to me. 
just random infantry knowledge stuff that is pretty common sense yeah. and they'll just be like um and some of it too with the super super fit dudes they've never been used to losing so yeah. it's the old it's the old business saying of a, a, a grade student will work for a c grade student because a c grade student knows how to grind and sort of hustle um and it's the same as I've, i'm not special forces but i've had a lot of guys um a, a lot of my close friends are sf and i'm going to a special operations conference next week but they it's a pretty commonly known thing that the guys who are finishing first all the time are sort of almost those you hand your kid a trophy at the end of every event when they go to special forces selection and they make them fail 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 they don't know how to deal with that failure um and i have a good friend of mine who you know as well who's now um into commando who no one people laughed at him when he's gonna go yeah, you're not the fittest you're not the most switch went there fucking smashed because he knew how to fail and, and push through that um so and that, that's sort of a thing to know so yeah but good on you with the drive man that's you're epic um so yeah if you guys have any more questions i'm not going to answer why people shave their legs in recon should be self-explanatory yeah gonna make these calves look good guys to a degree yeah you're gonna have big calves you have the biggest calves in the world you get uh, background info of my role in, in the military. If you're new to the to the chat, um, pretty much I spent eight years in the Australian Infantry, Australian, Australian Army in the Infantry. Mm. Um, six and a half years of that in Seven R R with where Willie serves at the moment. I'm going to get pissed again while you explain this. Yep, it's and, all a bit. And I um, I spent a year and a half studying Indonesian and living in Indonesia, so I became a qualified ling- linguist for the Australian Army. And um, I was quite frequently used towards the end of my career as a translator for one brigade in both uh, Indonesia and Australia for joint activities between Australia and Indonesia. So uh, I'm quite curious about that helmet uh, behind you're talking about behind me. It's just a it's a fake one. It's Willie's Willie's like get up for his uh, for his podcast area. So nothing nothing uh, special about it. And I don't want to touch it because if I might break it, he'll he'll hate me for it. But yeah, guys, um, if you've got any questions, feel free to hit us up. We'll probably have to wrap this up in about 20 minutes. So we're pretty much doing this because we just wanted to have a chat and share this chat with you guys. But um, hopefully you guys are at least learning something a bit about ourselves. But mostly if you guys are it's aspiring pe- or inspire, aspiring, aspiring, aspiring to join this, uh, the military, we're hopefully giving you some advice to at least get your head in the right right mental space pastoy in the u.s you'd get thanked to be a soldier etc is that the same in your country it's actually a really weird thing god no no look off okay so i was doing my promotion course um which was on a different base and i had my lunch at subway and i was sitting there and a security guard walked up to me and goes oh i just want to thank you for your service and like and this goes back to what i was talking about not being in the uh in the military eh, sorry not being in the middle east yet and I was like, "Oh, please don't thank me. I've I've done nothing. I'm 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 just you know I'm just a normal digger." He goes, "No, mate, it doesn't bother me. You thank you for your service. You're putting you're putting yourself into a position where you could be doing something." And I had it probably about half a dozen times in my career whilst I was serving, and it's not a massive thing because like we I think in most cities, it's pretty frequent to see people walking around with uh, in military uniform, except for probably Melbourne. Um, I think Melbourne was the only place I actually walked around and in in uniform, and people were like, "Whoa, there's a Who guy in you, uniform," man? you know. So um, it's not a common thing, but it's definitely it was it definitely does happen, just not all the time. Mm. You get a little bit. You get a lot on um, um, like Anzac Day and everything. Yeah, I heard he's correct about the um two CDO selection video there's a two commander oh fuck there's a two commander selection video yeah 2010 one it's called um, it might have been just called commando or something fair enough yeah oh bad. actually I think I've seen that now you would have yeah they're like, they're, they're like dragging a guy through the dirt and shit doing like a um, oh what do you fucking call it look at, oh, I don't even know in the UK, we weren't allowed to wear our uniform in public where it well was. Well, it's getting more like that. It is getting a lot like that in Australia, yeah. just because they don't want people being targeted. Um, Catch us what we think of the SF direct entry. We sort of went over this before, but it's it's hard it's, if, you, if you've never served before. 
Okay, so in some capacities, it's fucking really hard. targeted at people that are coming from some sort of other special operations, being mm. Star Force, Soggies, like and police, yeah, um, or it, reserves, police. But oh. I mean, reserves have got like imagine you went reserves now and then you did selection, yes. yeah. Um, so like as people but go, out, but to go from selection though, you wouldn't do the pre calls. Oh, that's true, but but like um, from I'm not saying it's not possible, but to go from. CV world direct entry special forces pff, fucking the, the success very, rate is quite slim I'd and, say it's less than one percent and this has gone back to the whole clearance diver kind of thing it, it's not about the actual person themselves they could be the fittest person they could actually be quite uh, intelligent as well they could be super intelligent it is that mental like um, mental durability and toughness yeah. that you just can't build up in such a short period of time it's no. like right now dude I honestly think I could put on my old pack and probably still stomp 10 to 15k with, yeah. with all the old gear yeah you and, don't forget your brain's a muscle and and honestly it's like i'm not the fittest as i used to be but i could still do it yeah um because i know one i can do it and two like my body is just so used to being beaten to thrashed like yeah yeah whereas people that come straight off city street they do three months at kapuka three months at it like they do like an advanced infantry um, course where it's, a, it's still at the school of infantry but it's like an advanced version and then they do like a pre-selection course uh, because they're direct entry they don't get any battalion time mm-hmm. they've got to play catch up there and then they, they're on course so in nine months they've gone from civvy to going for selection and in that nine months mm-hmm. they they don't have that beating that the battalion gives you yeah I'm not telling you not to do it but it's um, a pretty fucking tough gig like you think you've never picked up a fucking rifle before in your life and a, mach- a machine gun before in your life. Next thing you're learning this to be fucking good at it in a couple of months. You know, it's one, it's one of those hard things. It's just one of those things. It's like, yeah, I just wish I could, I could explain it better. Um, it's it, once you like, it's easy for us because we've seen, we've, we see people going for selection and, mm. and like I went for selection twice. I know people that have, um, I know super fit dudes have gone and come back. Super smart dudes yeah. have gone and come See, back. My, my, my issue was injuries. Um, it, it's really, it's target, like, not, not talking about direct entry, but special forces is targeted for people between 20 and 25. Um, sometimes 25 to 30, depending on their mental um, mm, yeah. m- mental maturity and all that. Um, the, the problem is with special forces is they actually look at you like how many years we're going to get out of you. Because the life expectancy, and not, I'm not talking the life expectancy as being alive, but the life expectancy of their career yeah. is a lot smaller in SF than it is in, um, in infantry, infantry. Anywhere else, yeah, pretty much. Because they get thrashed. Their bodies mm-hmm. get thrashed. Their, their minds get thrashed. Their time away from home is brutal. Yeah. And Oh, shit, yeah. And it's easier for a younger person to survive in that situation for longer than someone who's, say, 30, married with kids. But, but on that, I have a lot of good mates over there and it's one of the fucking best jobs in the world. Oh, dude, it's yeah. epic. You if you can do it, fucking do it. Exactly. So what You I'm can saying, be that dude sitting on a Black Hawk with your feet out the side with a fucking M4. And that's sick. Yeah. Um, Prudel says, um, I just write the stream, so hey, man. Um, about joining the German army. Um. I've got little experience with the German army, although I know that they are fucking super well trained and super well kitted out. I shit, I spent a day with the Germans in um, Afghanistan just on the on my base. Um, although I would see them drive past us every day, but um, not that much. The one thing on like initial reaction, they are gunned up to shit. Every single vehicle had like a, at least a fifty cal on top of it. Um, we're like, holy shit, these dudes aren't fucking around. Um, and the guys I met were all massive, like, they all towered over me, big beards, everything, I'm not sure if they were German special forces or not, I'm not sure, maybe they can have a beard in regular German infantry, I'm not sure, um, but they rocked up in, like, Mercedes, pretty much like G-Wagons, driving around with guns and shit, um, and they were some of the nicest dudes I'd ever met in my life, um, because I had to show them some things around the base, and they were super, super good dudes. The one thing I will say that they commented on that we don't do is they actually deploy a lot, lot more regularly than us, but a lot shorter. So my trip um, overseas was eight and a half to nine months-ish. 
um, where I could be completely false in this. I'm just going off my memory. Um, but they were more deploying, say, three months in every 12 months, where I might deploy nine months in every three years. They'll deploy every year for three months. Although it ends up the same amount of time. They deployed a lot more regularly, the German dudes. Um, but yeah, they were super, super nice dudes. And everything I've ever seen from the German army man, as far as videos and shit, or you can ex- like access on YouTube, is their kit is insane. Um, the money they have... Um, into say like the German KSK and units like that, absolutely mental amount of funding. Um, like they're rocking the night vision like up there, and that's eighty grand a piece. <laughs> like, yeah, um, absolutely go for it. Um, they've got some of the best units in the world, man, and do some super super sick shit on YouTube and Instagram. I got a video of like it's like German rap in the background of just like them kicking indoors. Oh, really? Like it sounds like if Ramstein mixed with like fucking Eminem <laughs> and it was hardcore shit it was epic but yeah man I haven't had the privilege of working with a lot of foreign militaries outside of Asia mm. um, but with the, the Asian countries um, a lot of them join the military with the intent to do it for the rest of their lives um, yeah, which is very foreign lives. for us Yeah, and I, I don't know about Europe if anyone's from um, from Europe or, or um, even America or anything like that I don't really know anyone. I only know probably two people in the eight years that I was in that straight up said, as soon as I met them, like as in like early in their career, had said, I want to be here for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, no, not it's not a career job. Whereas mm. I know with, um, for example, Indonesia, you, it's really weird, man. Like they, they get it, they get in the military. There's different tiers. There's like four different tiers. They can be officer and all the way down to the bottom ranks. Um, they actually have a direct entry corporal rank as well. Um, where you're Did a sex commander. Uh, Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's, it's technically a sergeant. Shit. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah. it goes private corporal. That's, your, that's actually like you do that like normal yeah. progression. Oh, yeah. And you end your career as a corporal. Right? Then they have actually a sergeant rank, which yeah. is sergeants of the section commanders. Now, they have different direct entries, but the way it works is you, as soon as you join the military and you get to the point where you have progressed in, in long enough and you're far enough in, you now... Um, get like a, a room on base like as in a house mm. so if you meet someone you can get married you, they get married very young over there um if you get married you have to introduce her to the co Shit. yeah it's pretty full-on man like, epic. and so then because how it works is you actually become part of the military family right yeah, yeah, yeah. so we, the, we need that we need more with, of that with the with the wife getting permission from the yeah. co to get married then he she now becomes um, a wife that can live on the base gets full oh, access yeah, of course they get a house on the base it's not like a full like this This would be a mansion this is a CO's house yeah here. but they get a house and then they get part of the community and, and all that it's and it's, it's very very different in, in Southeast Asia where majority of those militaries it isn't it's not conscription mm. it's it's actually um, a choice and they do it for they want to do it for the rest of their lives mm. um with our German mate. Um, sorry, I can't read your second message in German. But you asked when that is. It was 2017 when I met them. I think they might have been German Special Forces just by the look of their sort of kit out and gear and everything. Um, and you say with a lot of the vehicles not working, the SF dudes would have had epic vehicles working because these dudes rolled up like you wouldn't fucking believe, man. Shit through, like, through their teeth. Like, oh, so you guys are doing this? Like, fuck no. They're like, oh, we're going to go have a look at that. I'm like, seriously? Like... <laughs> You don't have air support? Like, okay, you do, you man. That was sick. Um, in the UK, a uh, guy talks about doing, you need, it's like 22 years. And they get in, their pension. In, and then you get your pension. We have so many guys in the UK move over. Yeah. Like, I have, um, I've had two previous platoon sergeants who were both Royal Marine Commandos. And I've also had um, a, a boss who was a Gurkha. He's come over. I probably um, know 10 people that lateral transfers. Yeah, lateral UK. transfers are massive. Because they come to the end, it's like, well, I'm, I'm, if they join at 18, yeah, they're, they're what? 40 years old. 40 years old. They would have been a warrant officer in the UK. They're on a, a pension of 70% or 60-something percent yeah, of their old they pay. Here. They get that same pay whilst in the Australian military getting, they go drop down to a sergeant's wage mm-hmm. and they get good money mm-hmm. here. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, I know a lot, a lot of the UK is, but you're probably right. A lot of them don't do their two, full 22 years. <sighs> I can imagine why. Oh, shit. Yeah, they've rolled um, pretty hard. Why do you think Aussies don't want a full career in the military? I think what actually happens is people join up at 17 to 22, mm-hmm. which is the main joining age. Like 95% of the people that join up are between 17 and 22. Um, and they join up thinking these these grand things. I'm going to be a door kicker and I'm going to be busting in yeah, doors, shooting SF people. Videos. 
yeah just playing call of duty and then they get to the battalion they realize that they're sitting on their ass on their phone 80 percent of the time like willie said before and they're getting absolutely slogged out field for the rest of the time in the hope that they might get selected for a trip mm. once every three to four years and then get they miss out on the trip and then they're out yeah fucking oh and because they just sit on their phone. it's not true they don't all sit on their phone but it's such a painful process to actually mm. get to properly do your job yeah oh it's a it can be years of waiting it can be years of waiting and i think by the end of that yeah and oh, i'm, and I'm gonna be man. completely honest it's probably at fault some of the more senior guys and i was probably one of them towards the end that um that talk about how shit the army is that actually makes it so the initial impressions of people that do first get to the battalion that are keen get tainted very quickly about how shit the military oh, you're is so right you rock up because guys oh this is shit and you're like oh right it's, it's wrong you need to make it your own career um back with our german guy they definitely weren't rocking g36s or hk 416s 417s um so i'd say sf um but yeah i think thinking it's been very informative um but yeah you're correct that it can be just tainted instantly by um by sort of how you see how you see it, like all, all the more senior dudes with their careers and it can be a, a terribly sort of poisonous fucking environment that guys can make it and that's what needs to be gripped up at points i guess as well i just lost my chat you just keep going oh right, yeah i've got my chat i'm um, waiting for a couple of questions to come through people <laughs> a couple of people said better not be a bush pig introducing you to the co um a lot of my experiences has been um mainly foreign military i've had a lot of work to do with danish um the irish especially actually a lot with the irish but i did a month with the um with the u.s marines as well um and fuck they hated their job <laughs> fuck i've never seen a grunge of soldiers hate what they do as much as the marines i think they, I've, just, they were so fucking off it and i was like oh my god if i've noticed anything infantry slash marine slash what we would call diggers mm. In every single country of the world, are pretty much the exact same person. Professional complainers. <laughs> but honestly, I could speak Indonesian and I'd be talking to Indonesian diggers and they'll be talking to our diggers and they'll make the exact same jokes. Yep. And then I'll be working with the Thai army or the Malaysians and it was always the same jokes. Like as in like, you know, yeah, I, I, probably half of them, are yeah, all of them are too inappropriate for Twitch. But it's like, <laughs> It's just like every military in the world, we're all treated the same in the same shitty situations and oh, we're just... Got the same people in charge. No matter what language they speak, <laughs> no matter what they look like, that happens, man. Um, I would definitely not say most clinics. I would re retire at 30. I'd say they've moved off into another special forces unit or they've just ranked up. Yeah, that's another thing is you've got a lifespan on your career. Mm. So even as a in the infantry, you say so the perfect the perfect promotion cycle would be four years digger, one to two years lance corporal, probably four years corporal, and at ten year mark you're a sergeant. Then you do four to six years as a sergeant, mm. maybe ten if you're a bad sergeant, and then um, you'll be a warrant officer, and then that's where you send spend the rest of your career. Warrant officers are purely based off positions, their promotions, yeah, um, to go, become one and to progress it, to, um, but through them, so. Um, that's all position based more than actual uh, time yeah, yeah. Um, and once you become a sergeant okay from once you become a corporal the corporal's the end of your soldiering so once yeah. you become a sergeant you pretty much just go admin even in the field you're pretty much just admin and then once you get out of the actual platoon commander position sorry the platoon sergeant position you now are completely admin in a different area yeah. of the battalion and then you become a warrant officer and you no longer do proper field by proper yeah. field, I mean, pack on your back, marching along, fire and movement. to die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, and yeah. they'd be the same with uh, SF elements too, up to a, an extent, and yeah. also um, every job in the military. Oh, it's everything, yeah. The higher rank you are, the more paperwork you do. I know a lot of guys, like, but the best time in my career was as a full corporal. Yeah. Lots of guys. No, everyone everyone says the best position in the army is a corporal. Yeah. you got some power, Even but you don't corporal. have too much. and yeah, you, also, you have enough not to get in trouble, but enough to do shit. Yeah. Pretty much, and you get to run the training if you, you digs. Oh fuck yeah! Mm. Oh. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I think unless you guys have any last minute questions, <laughs> we've got we've got pretty much um five more minutes, and that I think that would have to be it. My phone's about to die anyway, so yeah, so 
Um, I've been using questions. my phone this whole time to talk to you guys, so I apologize if I'm looking down a lot. <laughs> um, but honestly, thank you guys for everyone who's popped in today. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, I've had a great time. I'm, I'm actually um, semi-glad you've got out because I think a lot of your followers, who, like 99% here are yours, have got probably a lot out of um, actually you talk about your service. As you say, you don't really talk that much. And I get a lot out of this. I, re- I actually... Um, I really, really enjoy doing these. Um, it's what I want to do more of. I will be doing lots and lots more of these sort of interactive podcasts like this, where the first hour or so will be a sort of a more formal chat, um, and then the last bit will be more of a discussion, more of a discussion Q and A. Um, like it's fantastic to do one today with Paul, and that'll be pretty much number one. Um, and then after this, I've got some other veterans, some other sort of influential, influential. The word influential people um, rocking up to do it um, and we'll definitely do this at some point again I feel yeah I've, I've had a great time totally agree I'll, we'll quickly hit up Herody's question because I think it's a good one do you have any stories of people who uh, you looked up to as in senior diggers or NCOs when you uh, when you were lids news were lids <laughs> news were lids um shit um like I, I spoke about the time in, in basic training where that corporal pulled me aside when I was going to try and quit and he was telling me, if you quit here, you're going to quit at everything in your life. And that was a major changing point in my life, I actually. I actually remember that so crystal clear. Like, I think people have those those moments in their life where they actually change stuff up. Um, but I've had some really amazing corporals mm. and then some really shit ones. And you don't really think about the shit ones uh, uh, too much unless they were really bad and they did something really wrong. But... If, if you do get a good corporal you'll be mates with them for the rest of your life because you have yeah. so much respect for them mm. because you know they care some and of my I've, best mates were my corporals like yourself yeah so it, it really is um, it's the people that care and if you ever if anyone in this chat does become in the military and they do get to the rank where they're in charge of people you are you are almost like a father figure like you guys oh, call me you know more about them when than you, you guys call me dad on twitch like <laughs> like in, in in seriousness seriousness a lot of these guys come out of kapuka mm. at 18 years old and they don't have any proper mature guidance and um like they might have, you know, obviously they've had dads and stuff and um and they've grown up but then they haven't really had people show them how to actually do a lot of things yeah and it's that corporal, particularly the, I think the our biggest turning point for a lot of soldiers is who's their first corporal in a battalion Shit, yeah. can make them actually a really good soldier or not. And um, like, I know exactly who my first corporals were and they were great. And yeah, I'm, I'm the exact same. I, I still think talk most guys them. in infantry are. I'm maybe catching up with one of mine after this for a drink. It's been four and a half years. Yeah. It's, um, it's one of those, um, one of those sort of big things. It's, um, yeah, your original corporal stick with you and we um, on corporal's courses I'm not a corporal I'm a private but I've done a corporal's course um, they talk about um, leading in wartime environments versus non-wartime environments and leading in wartime you know your admin stuff like your weapon uh, or people's ammunition their health their water their food and then non-wartime it's like well making sure they fucking go out on a Saturday night to the clubs and they fucking get home alright yeah. um, you know it's a very we talk about sort of the army family and your seco is the first one they come to. If, if one of your privates runs in trouble, the first person you're going to is them. You get arrested. You're not calling your parents. You're calling your, your corporal first up. Um, you know, and it, it's one of those things. They're the ones that cover you from the top down and look after you fucking everywhere else. I've had some weird phone calls in my time. Oh, yeah, you would have. Um, we'll go with this one last question. Yeah. So it's uh, if people were to jo- want to join the infantry, what kind of training should you be doing in how, and how long to prepare? Honestly... <laughs> There's not really much you can do outside um, stuff we were talking about for SF. You can actually apply that to infantry just as, as well. Um, I personally think getting as fit, like the fitter you are when you get to the battalion, the better you're going to be received. Yep. Um, so you don't want to just be scraping by in Kapuka and Singleton. You no. want to be you want to be fit. So um, if you don't do any exercise right now, don't join the infantry. Go go to a gym, get a few personal training lessons. Go to bodybuilding.com. Yep. Go to YouTube learn how to do some exercise and mm. actually start training up uh, i would say as a benchmark you'd probably want to be able to do 50 push-ups in two minutes yep. you'd want to run a sub 10 2.4 and yep. um what's the other one sit-ups sit-ups as long as you do 60 yeah. uh 80 if you could do 50 unheld sit-ups you'd be killing it yeah, but if you could do like a hundred um 100 sit-ups with your feet held you're laughing so like it, I know, like, that's well below the benchmark. The benchmark would be like, 11 minutes 18. 
I think so. For yeah. 2.4 and it's like 35 push ups. But you, you might be fatigued at the time you do it. You might be fatigued and you don't want to be just scraping by the bare minimum. So no. um, you want to get in and smash it. And, and the big one I'd say is preparing is it's a really it's a bit of a how long it's a bit of string how long to prepare like well that how long you might, do you need how long do you need like some people could enter tomorrow um some people might need two years um i'd say going from oh, fuck i don't want to say average fitness but let's just say average 18 year old fitness yeah. six months i would say and, and, and of and running honest, burpees push-ups and to be honest probably the biggest thing that's going to prepare you more than anything if you're 18 and you haven't uh left home before oh get the fuck out of home I'm not saying move out. What I would say is go on a two-month trip overseas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you don't have to go somewhere expensive. If you're from Australia, go through Southeast Asia. Like, yeah. you know, you could probably go two months in Southeast Asia on about three or $4,000, mm. you know. Um, a comf- actually, you could if you know what to do. Um, you could easily go oh, $1,000 a month. Yeah. Um, but what I'm saying is get away from home because when you're in a shit spot in Southeast Asia or wherever you go in the world, if you can afford somewhere cooler, go somewhere cooler. But if if you're away from home for a long period of time, you're got, not going to be... Um, you're going to be more... You're not just dependent on someone else. Yes. You're self-sufficient. you got to make decisions for yourself. Yeah. You what know? you do directly counteracts how you're going to be fucking eating that night. Yes. And so when you go to the Kapuka and Singleton and all those other places and you... Like Singleton's a lot better because you've actually got mates there. You actually got mates by that point. Yeah. But Kapuka, it's literally like, hey, who's that guy sleeping next to me every night? Yeah. And Fuck it takes yeah. about a, about takes a good couple of weeks before you really start bonding. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, you bring up a great point to get at it because I never really the longest I spent away from home is maybe two or three nights before I went, and I fucking struggled with that. Like I was homesick as shit. The majority my first of people few more homesick than anything. My first few home calls, home calls, home phone calls, letters and shit. I was just homesick. Yeah. Um, and that's just what it was. Um, and that makes it so much fucking harder. Get out, do some stuff. That's my biggest advice. And if you don't feel you're mature enough yet, wait. You take a gap year and travel, or take a gap year and just learn yourself, and then enter. You want to be pretty sure on who you are before you go, and pretty sure that that's what you want to do. My last bit of advice mm-hmm. is don't sign up to a job you don't want to do. Yep. I don't care what recruitment says, and I'll straight up. I would straight up bag them. Like I hate how they do what they do to diggers. Um, Honestly, if if you want to do a job in the military and they say it's not available uh, for another six months, wait right. that six months. Yeah. Don't let them go. Oh, you can join this job and transfer in twelve months. You won't transfer. You won't. No. I, I I really can't stress that enough. Yeah. Um. And sort of on my last bit of advice, we'll finish it up here. Um. Out of personal note and everything is, uh, firstly, you know, follow your dreams. If if you really want to be a clearance diver or in the infantry or special forces fucking do it plenty before you have done it people put it on a pedestal that it's impossible well it's it's not yes it's hard but there are people in those jobs doing it um so if you honestly want to do it do it and as always you know make sure you look out for yourselves look after your own mental health if you become in a position where you've got guys under you we talked about this before that look after the guys beneath you because you might be a a corporal and not think you know i'm not a father figure well you, you might be to someone you don't know what they've come through. You don't know what they're going through. So look after them. Look after your you know, subordinates and you know, your people across from you. Um, look after and your you'll mates. make mates for the rest of your life as you well. You will. And if you're not a, a, what was the term? If you're not Jack, if you're not an asshole, you'll make great mates. Yeah. Just be a good, I, I, I know it's a bit of throwback, be a good bloke. You know, look after the guys, work hard. You'll be absolutely fine. We've done it and we're fucking average dudes. Yeah. Um, Look after yourself. Look after your mates, left and right. You, you be honestly, you're fine. And if you need anything else, reach out to me. Um, I'm probably more available. I guess. Maybe. I'm always, I'm always down yeah. for chat. I'm just very busy. But yeah, um, you're, you're, my you're Insta- a lot more Direct busy. message me on Instagram, yeah. my Discord. Yeah. Um, if you just click on uh, my my Pestoy Twitch account, give me a follow over there and talk to me anytime. Yeah, and I do, chat. I do chats like this. Um, more. I'm doing these Mondays and Fridays. I'm going to start doing a lot more of these sort of Q and A style chats and even ones where i've got a guest or i don't have a guest and it's just literally me answering any questions i've got about the army um to the best of my ability um so we'll finish up there yeah so yeah. firstly thank you very much willie oh, for yeah. um having me here it's been a great fun oh, anytime man. anyone who's come from my channel um thanks very much for popping in saying good day it's, it's been great to actually just have a chilled stream uh, i know you guys my stream gets pretty crazy at times and it's hard for me to actually have a good <laughs> conversation um, and if you guys enjoyed hanging out with Willie, um, be sure to pop back. He, he streams only a couple of days a week, but when he does, he's here just to answer your questions and talk talk shit and 
and hopefully uh, help you guys get through either physical, mental, or uh, tough times. Mm-hmm. And he's a really great dude, and I wouldn't be hanging out here if I, if I didn't honestly believe that. So mm. um, thank you very much for, for, oh, no for having me. Um, thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. You've got a massive following on this. You've really helped me out, sort of kickstart my way into this to help. And my whole thing is to help you guys out. That, that's why I'm doing this. So I want to be able to put that little bit of knowledge, a little bit of experience that I've got and um, and help you guys out where I can if it's emotionally, mentally, um, or, or even career-wise. Um, more than happy to help out. I'll be doing this a couple of days a week. Um, if you need anything else, just mes- feel free to message me um, probably on my Instagram, which is the same as my my Twitch thing. So, um, yeah, we'll be finishing off the stream there. And, um, you know, f- a massive, massive um, thank you for coming in. So, cheers, guys.